with American exceptionalism, a double-edged sword. On Book Notes, Sunday night at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. Now we continue this hearing on access to FBI files. Wednesday, a House committee began hearings to examine how the White House obtains background files from the FBI. This portion of the hearing lasts two hours. The uh, committee will resume its sitting and come to order. And if our witnesses can retake their places, I will proceed with the uh, questioning. And the next uh, uh, gentleman I'd like to recognize, the gentleman from West Virginia, Thank Mr. You, Wise, for Thank five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to open my uh, questions by stating that I think that based on what has come out so far, not only in this hearing, but also in the, in the media and depositions and other information. There's absolutely no question, I think, on anybody's mind that you could probably, in the court of public opinion today, definitely get a verdict of gross incompetency, probably with a count of total insensitivity. Uh, as one who used to chair the privacy subcommittee of this full committee, I take uh, great, great umbrage uh, at what has transpired. And Mr. Culverhouse, I think that uh, uh, the concerns you've expressed are quite, quite appropriate. Now, having said that, I also think it's important that this be a bipartisan inquiry and that we try to proceed as much as possible because the issue really, everyone acknowledges there was great incompetency in the handling of these records that it, in, and, in, uh, and, as I say, insensitivity. The real issue, though, is does it go beyond that? And, for, and it seems to me the proper approach of this committee is there are two issues. One is how did this procedure happen and what steps are being taken to make sure it didn't happen again? Second one, though, is a much more serious, is a very serious one, and that is, was there anything beyond incompetency here? And did, what were the purposes in securing or obtaining these files? Uh, in that vein, uh, I have some questions which, if I can get them answered quickly, would be very, very much appreciated. Um, First of all, in terms of the procedure that was used, which as I understand it from all the councils testifying, and I believe uh, Ms. Gemmell and Ms. Dannenauer as well, the procedure that's been used has basically been in place for at least 30 years. That was, the procedure, that was at least what Mr. Shapiro found in his report to the FBI. And in it, uh, he, and so that while we can talk about how closely people adhered to the procedure, the FBI itself on page, at least page three of their statement, uh, press statement, uh, Director Free said, it is now clear that the system was very vulnerable to misuse and that government officials over several decades, including himself, Director Free, had not provided adequate oversight of the system, resulting now in violations of privacy. So this was a system that had intrinsic flaws from the beginning. Is that not correct? I don't agree that, that the system had intrinsic flaws because it went 30 years without any uh without any problem like this. But so. in terms of, uh, Mr. Gray, in terms of the procedure that was used, there was always the opportunity, was there not, for this reason. You have testified, and you have in your statement, that you yourself did not review each of these requests for update files personally, that you used a form that had your name, I presume, stamped on it, as your predecessors and successors also used. Is that not the case? Yes, that is the case, but I believe the FBI itself understood that something was slightly uh, irregular because they notified the White House, Free's, uh, uh, Shapiro's uh, state, uh, report makes this clear, that they notified the White House during this file search for the 400 uh, that no name checks were being done. That is, they weren't, in addition to copying the file and sending it over, doing a name check on that file. That now, and the White House apparently responded, nobody was identified as being either the maker or the recipient of the telephone call, that, that they understood that and that was consistent with what the White House was doing. And what I tried to say in my earlier testimony was the, the unearthing of an old file like that without a name check should raise um, a, a red flag right there because the, there could be no legitimate purpose for, for asking for that file or I would, would, would suggest providing it. Well, but your statement, which I thought your written testimony was very, very complete and assisted me in preparing for this, uh, you note on page 9 that this memorandum would, and you're talking about updates here, 
This memorandum would, as a formal matter, show the White House counsel as a requesting official. However, the document was routinely issued by the director of the security office without review or signature by anyone in the counsel's office. Let me repeat, though, if I, if I well, can, Well, I mean, sir. I think you've stated it well, and, and you've put your position out there, but I also think it's important to state that no White House counsel, at least according to well, no, it appears that no White House counsel was personally signing off on these requests, because I need to get to the second part, yes, which yes, is... Yes, 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 I believe I would like to, to, to just correct this. Except for people who were already working at the White House, Thank more you. or less permanent staff, yes, sir, people because like in the travel office or the correspondence office, people, permanent staff, unless you're talking about those people, each one of us would have signed off on well, the request for... Okay. I'm uh, going to have to come back. I have a unanimous consent request, Mr. Chairman, and that is that during questions posed to these witnesses, the, the impression was left by the chair and others incorrectly that the White House did not turn over to the committee the personal file, personnel files of past and current White House employees because of concerns about executive privilege. I would request unanimous consent to place into the record a letter from Jack Quinn, counsel to the president, to Chairman Klinger dated June the 10th, 1996, clarifying that the concern of the White House was not executive privilege but, and I quote, the concern regarding these records was for the privacy of the individuals involved, close quote. I would ask you now Without consent. objection, the letter will be entered in the record at this point, and the gentleman's time has expired, and I now recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Schiff, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to first begin by responding to some comments made uh, by one of our colleagues a little earlier that this hearing is an attempt to bolster the Dole presidential campaign. Mm. Now, the fact is that the Dole presidential campaign didn't put FBI files into the White House. The Clinton administration did, all by itself. And the fact of the matter is, Mr. Chairman, you have tried to close this matter a number of times. You've tried to put the travel office investigation to rest. But each time you've tried to do that, new information, unexplained information, damaging information has come out. The first time around, we had a hearing on administrative investigations of the travel office firings. and We found out the White House hid documents from the administrative investigators. Then we had a hearing in which it was testified to by a, a, a White House administrator through a memorandum he wrote that quite possibly the firing of, of those employees was ordered by people much higher than himself, which is what we were told by the White House. And finally, at the point of a legal gun, a, a, a House vote for a criminal contempt of Congress citation, we get these documents. We learn uh, about the existence of FBI documents inappropriately at the White House. And we've received no real explanation as to why these documents were, were, were hidden from us. The, there was a reference, I think I just heard, that this was to protect the privacy of the individuals involved. Well, we, st we don't have the FBI files in this committee, and we haven't asked for them. The fact is, if this was an innocent bureaucratic mistake, as we're being told, why didn't the White House reveal that it happened a long time ago? Well, why the gentleman yield. It's my understanding you do sorry, have those I'm files. Sorry, I'm sorry, but I've But you're yield. making an incorrect I'm statement, regu sir. Regular order, Mr. Chairman. Would the chairman regular correct? Order. Regular order. The uh, I'm has sorry, but nobody on that side of the aisle will yield, so I'm not about to start now. Yeah. The fact of the matter is that these documents not only were not revealed by the White House, which you'd think they would have done if this was an innocent bureaucratic mistake, but we had to pry them loose against their claim of executive privilege, which is normally a national security reason to keep things from Congress. So I, I, I think there is more than ample room uh, to understand why this investigation continues. I, too, wish it would, be put, it would be put to rest, but new revelations have prevented that from happening. With that, Mr. Chairman, I have a few clarifying questions. Ms. Gemmell, if I may address you, because I believe that you are the most recent employee at the White House, having left in August of 1993. And I'd like to ask, do you know what list Mr. Marseka uh, was working from uh, for, for which he obtained the White House, excuse me, obtained the FBI documents. In other words, where did the list come from of names that he was using to ask the FBI for records? Yes, sir, the only list to my knowledge was the list that was received from the Secret Service, which was left behind at the time of my departure. All right. And did, did you personally give him a list? Oh, no, documents? sir. I had no idea who would be assuming that responsibility. Did you ever see the list? Yes, sir, I did. Um, can you, can you describe what the, what the update project that you were working on until August 13th was? Basically, again, sir, it was just simply setting up the very first stages of it. 
and basically that means that you were making dummy files, in other words, file jackets that would be used down the road. So therefore you were typing file labels, you were typing subject files. As an example, if you were processing the General Service Administration employees, you would type a subject file for that group also. Did you have a, a way of dividing up the Secret Service files, that is GSA group here or White House group there, or something like that? As I recall the list, sir, the list of employees was by category. In other words, was by office. All right. And, and how many different offices were there, do you know, involved here? <coughs> Numerous, sir, because that list would have also included such entities from the outside, so to speak, such as AT&T telephone company employees, C&P telephone company employees that were also housed there at the White House. I understand. Uh, I'd like to go down the list of witnesses because several witnesses tried to answer questions that were propounded to them and were interrupted by the members who were asking the question. I'd like to see if any witness did not get an opportunity to finish an answer that they might have, might have wanted to. Uh, Mr. Gray, may I start with you? Is there anything that uh, you wanted to add or state that you didn't have the opportunity to? Well, if you, if you think about the harm that's done by allowing uh, an Army employee, um, a Democratic political operative, and it could be a Republican political operative in a Democratic administration, to look over um, all of these files at, at his leisure, um, uh, some 400 of them. In the future, in the future, people who are, are to be recruited to serve in administrations, and as to them, people who are going to be asked about these people as to their character and their um, ability, it's going to have a chilling effect because how, how are you going to know um, whether you can trust the confidentiality of what you're doing? That's, that's the harm here and it's all very well and good to say that they're going to put uh, procedures in and I certainly hope that these procedures are adhered to. All I'm saying is damage is done and as uh, A.B. said, how does he know when um, an another Republican president is elected? Uh, that this information won't be somehow uh, used in a surreptitious way uh, in, uh, the, uh, in a new confirmation process involving him. Mr. Culverhouse, do you have anything you wish to add, sir? I've been ably represented by Mr. Gregg. <laughs> All right. Mr. Hauser. Uh, the point I was going to make was on the damage issues related to a question from Mr. Lantos. Um, but I, I did want to um, respond to one other question earlier in terms of um, the treatment of these files. Uh, if there was an individual for whom coming through the process that there was derogatory, we would not make that information even available to the, inf to the individual, the subject of the investigation, and we would direct them to the FBI to file a Privacy Act request and a FOIA request so that they may adequately respond to, to the file themselves. Uh, also, I don't think it's clear about update, what an update is. We are not updating, and the process is project update, is not updating a f an investigative file to bring it current. It is simply to recreate a file that pre-existed at the White House. And there's a big distinction there between, again, current employees and prior employees. And that's, that's all I would add. For right. Thank you. I see my time has expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. Let, it, uh, let the record note that we have, the committee has received the uh, background file on Billy Ray Dale. Uh, we did not request it. It was sent to us by the White House. It is the only uh, background file, however, that we have had. In fact, we've specifically uh, indicated we did not want to receive uh, any other files, so we only have one in our possession. And now I would be pleased to yield to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Spratt, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank our witnesses for their testimony. On June the 12th, the New York Times published an account of this matter, and in it they say that the Secret Service maintained two lists. One was a list of those who had full or unfettered access to the White House, and each of them had what's called colloquially a hard card. And there was a second list, according to this article, which was a complete list of everybody who had access, those with full access, and those with just limited access, whatever that is. Is that correct, Mrs. Shemo? Sir, I was never aware that there were two separate procedures. Have you since been informed that this is the case? You say you never were. Is this... Is this... Of course, I, I saw the same information in the paper. Yes, sir. Yeah. And 
Is it correct in this article that Mr. Marseco requested from you a list, and the list given was the, apparently the second list, the more comprehensive list, which the Secret Service had failed to uh, update by deleting those who had turned in their cards? Sir, all I can say is that when we requested the list from Secret Service, that the list requested was for current pass holders. Current pass holders? Yes, sir. And it didn't distinguish between those with hard cards, those with full access, or those with limited access. It was just current access. No, sir. Again, I didn't even know that such another list existed. Yeah. Did you transmit that request to the Secret Service? Yes, sir, I did. And did you have any conversations by telephone or personally with the Secret Service agent to compile the list? I may well have, because the list does require Do you have any recollection of those conversations or any description or characterization which the Secret Service placed upon the list in transmitting it to you? No, sir, I do not. Is it your understanding it was maintained in some sort of computer database? Yes, sir, it was a computerized list. So it was just a computer run which they delivered to you of these names on it? That is correct, yes, sir. Did you examine the list and find anything yourself uh, out of order, out of date about it? No, sir, because, again, it was simply represented to us as being a current past roster. And did you then hand the list over once it was submitted to you to Mr. Marseco? No, sir, I did not. When I retired, the list was left in the vault. I did not know who would be picking up with the project. I see. How did it come into his possession? You, you did, after that, you have not since been employed in the uh, personnel office? No, sir, I have not. Okay. So you obtained the list and was left in the vault, and this was apparently the list that Mr. Marseca by some means obtained. Yes, sir. Do you know Alinda Wetzel? Wetzel, was she working there during your time? I believe it might be Lisa Lisa, Wetzel. I beg your pardon. Yes, sir. You. Yes, yeah. sir. Now, are you familiar at all? Have you discussed with anybody the uh, manner in which she came upon the same list and determined herself that there were errors in it and then undertook to correct the flaws? No, sir. I haven't had no discussions of that nature. Mr. Gray uh, or Mr. Culverhouse or anyone else who's had the experience, uh, what laws, executive orders, and White House memoranda control this process? Is there a statutory law that controls access? Are there standing executive orders that control the security clearance process? Well, there's the Privacy Act to begin with, and then yeah. there are all kinds of uh, uh, intelligence um, uh, guidances and statutes that involve uh, security clearance. And you have to understand that other agencies other than the FBI do so security clearance work for other agencies. Um, uh, so there are a myriad of statutes and, and procedures that affect this process. But in terms of how, as far as I know, how our offices ran this process, no, there's no law It's custom anywhere. and it's procedure. Cu custom you and you procedure. understood the sensitivity of it. You didn't have any written memoranda that That's dictated correct. how access I mean, would be obtained. A, 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 a B, is that... Now, when you were doing an update, did you have to fill out a Form 86 for each name that you wished to request an updated file for? Yes, everybody who was going to be updated, or everybody who had been through a full-field investigation, time had elapsed since his last or her last service, wanting to come back in the government, uh, in the White House or in the Cabinet, would have to fill out a new Form 86 to carry forward from the last date of, uh, of employment in the government and a full field investigation would be run to fill the gap between the last day of government service. Even for holdovers, though? Even for holdovers, permanent staff who were continuing? For the permanent staff, there would be, um, it perhaps wouldn't be for, for the, maybe Jane can answer this, it perhaps wouldn't be for, uh, uh, you know, a, a clerk in the, in the White House. They wouldn't have to fill another Form 86, but there would be a process by which they would be re-cleared. Their, their, um, Every four years Every four you do an years. update on their background, but they would what, what sort of need to know do you need to demonstrate to the FBI in order to obtain access to the uh, information sought by the Form 86? What, what showing is necessary? What showing is necessary for, for what purpose? You send a form to the FBI and you say, I want the background file on this individual. What is the 
What is the formulation that you must uh, deliver to the FBI? Do you simply say that well, he the is form is the, the form that I know the form, shown. but I, what need to know do you have to demonstrate? What well, I, level of evidence or proof do you have to present? Well, the thing that we've all tried to say, I think, is is that with respect to 99 percent of all people for whom information would be requested from the FBI are consenting to it by filling out this Form 86. And it's a very routine process and it's always a, has been. It's a very routine process. And believe me, when you finish do doing your Form 86, you know what you're in for. <clears throat> the only time that we wouldn't have triggered a request to the FBI for, for, a, for a prior file is in connection with basically the permanent staff of the White House, who, as Dick has tried to say, I think, are on notice by the fact that they're permanently employed there, are going to have their files recreated and, re -up and updated in the ordinary course of the four-year turnover. The gentleman's time has expired, and I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Zella, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm particularly concerned here because uh, two people from New Hampshire are on that list, Paul Collins and Dave Carney. and. Uh, Bobby Charles, my staff director of our subcommittee of national security, and and uh, I just uh, when Mr. Lantos made his comments uh, and, and others, um, I, I kind of think of this as kind of my relationship to my bank. Uh, he, the, my banker, has my confidential files, and if they are shared with my competition, uh, the question might be, well, so what? What damage occurred? Well, a lot of damage occurred, and it's pretty hard to quantify. Um, I would ask, uh, um, and, and I guess 18 or 20 year olds that haven't been cleared, um, that have access to this, uh, being able to order files, uh, I, would, I would ask uh, Mr. Gray and also Mr. Uh, Culverhouse, uh, you know, how serious is this? Is, is this uh, something that Democrats as well as Republicans ought to be concerned with. This is a process that's been enforced for 30 years. Uh, isn't this something to do with integrity and honor? Um, what, are, what are your reactions to how, how serious? What about our national security? How far could this be breached? Well, it's hard, it's hard to know just what harm was done. But let me first say that I don't know where this so-called list came from. I, gather Nancy Gimbel doesn't either. I don't think anybody does, at least not, I don't. But let's assume that somehow a list materialized that, 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 that somebody started acting on by requesting individual files off that list. I, what I don't understand is how anybody could have read through 400 files. I don't see how they could have read past four files or read past Jim Baker and continued to spend two or three months reading through these files that were going to produce no official action. I just don't understand that. And people were in and out of this room, detailees, interns, people with no clearance. Who else was looking at these files? That to me is, is, the, is the puzzle here. Maybe, maybe they were requested um, accidentally from the FBI, and maybe the FBI accidentally provided them, although they noted there was some irregularity because there were no name checks being requested in addition. But how anyone could have read through them and then left them there and had no intention up until the <coughs> confrontation with this committee of turning them back, that to me is, is a total mystery. Well, is it possible, let me just add a question, and then uh, is it possible that a team of people were looking at this? If one person hasn't, you know, couldn't go through them, uh, how many people would it take? I mean, are there a lot more people or was it just the fact that they were there? Well, it's the fact that they were there and security does not appear to have been very tight. That's but I, I don't know who, who, who went in and looked at him. I just don't know. Mr. Colvinhouse. Uh, Congressman, I, I share many of, uh, of Boyd and Gray's concerns. Uh, I mean, the, the reason that all of us are troubled by this is that we, our, our process was, was so tied. It was, so, it was professionally administered by Jane, who deserves most of the credit. She was the only person in her office, all of whom were cleared, all of whom were trained, that looked at the files. Uh, she was the only person who requested the files. There were no detailees, no interns, no one who wasn't trained, no one who wasn't cleared. And then, other than Jane, 
and the Secret Service and the FBI. It was only one or two lawyers in, uh, in the counsel's office that looked at the files. So that is the, the, the concern that we, we are being, uh, that we are conveying. And finally, everyone that we looked at had consented to their file being looked at by us. So, uh, so that, 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 that's the concern. That's the potential for harm. So there was a code of conduct, at least among yourselves, that uh, you, you knew the difference between right and wrong, and there was a code of conduct that you would, you would adhere to. Is yes, that a sir. fair statement? Yes, and, and, Mr. Chairman, I, I just get concerned because of the, the, the hearings that we've had on the White House Communications Agency, Travelgate, and others. And it just seems to me that we have a situation here where, uh, and some, some people on the other side have indicated, well, in spite of the fact that this is just gross or great incompetency, you know, so what? There's no damage. I think that it is serious, and I think it leads to integrity. Um, Mrs. Grimal, uh, was there a, a, uh, a photocopier in that room? Yes, sir, there was. And what do they use a photocopier for? Uh, normally to process, make copies of the past request to Secret Service, and also make copies of the name check request, as well as, as, well as the fulfilled investigation request going to the FBI. They request forms. And, and was there a possibility of any of these 18 or 20 year olds or people that weren't cleared? Is it possible that they could have made copies of any of the information that was available? Copies of the forms? Files? The files? Of the okay. files. I can say, sir, at least when I was there, they were never left alone in that office. So there was, while you were there, uh, a, a procedure that never left anybody alone that they could have made copies of the no, files? No, sir. Did you actually see the list uh, that uh, Special Agent uh, Anthony Marseca was using? I can only assume it was the same list that was left behind. But sh did you actually see it and go through it? And you know, I mean, did you, are you familiar with the list and you saw the list? I certainly saw the list that was delivered by Secret Service, yes, sir. But did you see the list that he was using? No, sir. I retired before he was brought on board. Okay. Um, I, I, just, uh, um, I just would like to make a statement to those who feel that this is no big deal. Um, I just feel very strongly, Mr. Chairman, that uh, as we get to the bottom of this, uh, whether they were used or whether people feel that, that damage was done, I certainly think that the people involved have a right to know how they were used um, and they are the ones that are concerned. I certainly wouldn't want to have my medical records passed around or my financial records passed around. And I'll yield back the balance of my time to you, sir. Uh, here's the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, thank you for that, your generosity. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I now would be pleased to recognize my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kanjorski, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Gummel, let me, let me get something straight. Uh, You'd sat in this position in several administrations. Was it common at the end of every administration, regardless of party affiliation, for all the records and the computer on the White House to be destroyed or, or emptied or purged? Uh, no, sir, they were not destroyed. All, file, all files departed the premises. They were considered to be part of presidential papers. Okay. Now, was it? Uh, when files were requested from, uh, during the Reagan administration and the Bush administration from the FBI under these forms, these were copies of FBI files. These weren't the original FBI files. Is that correct? That is correct, they, sir. They created some copy of files, and you don't know whether they were complete files or partial files. Is that correct? I mean, you, there was no one in your office that went back to the FBI to a check the original source of what was in the original FBI files. It was just that a request was made and a, a, a file was sent over and purported to be, quote, the file, whatever that meant by the FBI. That is correct, sir. And that was a copy. It wasn't their original. Is that correct? That was a summary copy, yes, sir. And, and when, when, you, when whoever was in charge of reading through this file, read through it, and, and had no reason to refer to counsel because there were no problems of security involved, that file then would be put into the vault. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. And, and that's the process that occurred in all the administrations you were there? Yes, sir, that is correct. And then at the end of the administration, all those files that were in the vault, and they would sometimes would have to be thousands, 
would then be made part of the presidential archives and sent to wherever all the records of that particular presidency went. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Those files were sealed. Right. So that it is reasonable to assume that in the Reagan administration and the Bush administration, there are files of everybody who had uh, an SF-86 file or a clearance in the White House where a copy of their FBI file came over to the security office. And in all these presidential libraries around this country, there are these type of FBI files. That is my understanding, yes, sir. Now, do we know whether they're under seal or are they open to academics or anybody to get in and read those files? I, I think most presidential papers are available to academics, aren't they? Uh, actually, sir, if it is permissible, this is the area of expertise of Ms. Dannenhauer, if I would be allowed to defer to her. But Ms. Dannenhauer, do you know, are these files sealed in all these libraries Indeed around the Indeed, they are sealed, yes, sir, and they're sealed for a number of years. Do you know how many years they're sealed for? They, it used to be 25. I'm not sure if it's still 25. I think it's 20. 20 now. I think okay. it's 20. But in all the course of the, of the administrations that Mrs. Gummel uh, served under, Nobody thought that th it may be that these are s of such import to the individuals involved to protect privacy that rather than keeping the file in the vault, that the file is either sent back to the FBI for destruction or for protection, but instead it's, it's purported on. So we may have, we may have individual files in, of uh, FBI files all over this country in different vaults. Is that well, they would be in, in each uh, presidential library, yes, sir. But, but they anybody, are, anybody but who had an authority to ask for an FBI file would get a copy of the individual's FBI file, and then they're put into some vault somewhere, and they're all over the country. But there are other papers in there, sir. That's why they're considered presidential papers, part of the presidential papers. There are other but they papers. Are, but they are separated out from the regular presidential archives. They were never intermixed with the uh, presidential archives, the regular presidential archived files. But, they were but, but, separate, but you're not and they that, were sealed. Yes, okay. sir. But you're not saying that the files had additional information put in the FBI file. The FBI file remained the FBI file. It may have become part of another file, but that was substantially nothing that the White House added to it. It was just what was sent over from the FBI well, that representing was, that file. Yes, sir, but that was part of each individual file. It, that report, if you're speaking of the reports, they were never separate, they were never well, separate well, from... That, that is a good question. I think everybody in this listening audience, I, I have never had the ability to work in the FBI, so I don't know what we're talking about with an FBI file, and you're obviously an expert in this. Are these the raw files, absolute raw files, or are these the developed files and summary sheets developed by the people at the FBI to do the raw file and raw investigations. It's the latter, sir. They are they it's are the summaries. Summary. It's yes, the they summary. are summaries, yes, sir. So that it's 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 not exactly what Mrs. Jones told about her neighbor next door in raw quoted verbatim material. It's a summary. So if Mrs. Jones said that uh, uh, the person being investigated into was uh, uh, unworthy of having a job, and in the midst of that investigation, she asked for a timeout so she could go and talk from the person from outer space, in the, in the FBI report it would sort of indicate that this individual being interrogated was not very responsible and therefore not a great deal of credence should be paid. You would have state. to ask that question, sir, of the FBI. They are the ones preparing the summaries. We get the summary of the raw data. Right. But, we but never so, see the raw so data. So that the record is very clear. Under Mr. Gray's administration, Mr. Uh, uh, Colin House's administration, Mr. House's administration, they never went to the FBI and said, hey, guys, we only want to use these files to check things, and there's no need for us to continue these files to remain here. Let's set up a procedure and send them back. They allowed thousands of files so that in the Reagan administration, literally thousands of files would have come over by the FBI. Then when they left office, their files went off to the uh, archives. And the Bush yes, administration sir. would come in, you'd have to update all these files and call for all these new recreated copies of FBI files, put them in the vault, then when Bush administration leaves, they go off to the Bush archives, then the Clinton administration comes in and they've got to call for a third set of all these personal FBI files and they're brought over and finally they remain in that vault uh, for this period of a year or two 
And we're, we haven't yet had an archives established. We witness, may not but for sir, the next few witness years. going to answer the question, but the time, sir, gentleman's time is they wouldn't be the same files. It's a different administration. Well, they, would not have no, they would have no need. Well, don't I'm sorry, the gentleman's files. time has expired. If I may, Mr. Chairman, don't these files, aren't these the gardeners, the chauffeurs, the cooks, the maids, the people that remain on the permanent staff of the White House for 20, 25, 30 years? Yes, we do have the so those The files. gentleman's time has expired. Yes. And I'm now pleased to recognize a gentlelady from Florida who I'd ask if she would yield to me for one question to of the... Of course. Uh, just to ask this question, if in fact you had discovered that you had erroneously uh, requested files to be sent over to the uh, White House, presumably because of, of a clearance uh, situation, and you discovered that they were in fact inappropriately called, would you have returned those files then to the FBI where they uh, had been inappropriately claimed from? Yes, sir, we certainly would. Yes, Mr. Chairman, they would go back immediately, but it didn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to uh, uh, congratulate you once again for uh, holding this very important uh, hearing. You've held uh, many important ones uh, during your tenure as chairman. And I'd like to uh, add my voice uh, uh, to the others who have expressed their great dismay and extreme concern about the misuse of the, the FBI files. As, as we have been discussing, these files uh, contain uh, some of the most uh, sensitive information on individuals that is collected anywhere in our country, and the information, often uh, untested and uncollaborated, it can ruin a person's life uh, if it is made uh, public. We've been discussing how privacy is something that's very dear to us as Americans, and I find it incredible that the White House was able uh, to request such uh, confidential documents from the FBI and then simply store them, as uh, Mr. Zeliff has pointed out in, in his questioning, uh, in an unsecured area. Not only was the room wide open, but as uh, the testimony has revealed, interns without security clearances uh, routinely worked in the room, and the copy machine was there, only feet away from the area. Anyone could have made copies, and no one would have been the wiser. So we hope that we can get to the, to the bottom of uh, all of these uh, terrible uh, issues. I have uh, uh, some questions about the, uh, the kinds of lists uh, that, that were used, phone lists, et cetera, and, and I wanted to ask uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Dannenauer uh, a few questions. Uh, this is the, the phone list uh, of the executive office of, of the president uh, early on in, in the administration. Uh, uh, James. Uh, Baker is not on this list. I was looking through it. Uh, neither is uh, Marlon uh, Fitzwater, or uh, nor is uh, uh, Mr. Culverhouse. So there are many ways to find out who was at the White House at a, at a specific time, and I, I want to understand how how this could have happened. So, Mrs. Uh, Dan Hour, Dan and Hour, could you could you tell us if you cross-checked information before you before you sent it out? What kind of cross-references uh, did you use? Uh, uh, can you name them uh, for us? Uh, excuse me, are you speaking of the current administration? Because I was not there. No, the expertise that you have during oh, the, the expertise. time. Oh, the expertise. Right. Well, yes, we, we would cross-check many, many lists before we would ever order anything from the FBI. Indeed, we would. And if there was a question on the Secret Service list initially, if we didn't, the advantage we had, I think, was that we knew a lot of the names. We wouldn't know the people personally, but we knew a lot of the names at the start of a new administration. And so if there is something there that we are not certain of, we would have other ways to find out by going to White House personnel. In the, in the Bush administration, we refined it in that the day the person came in to sign in to the uh, for employment, the correct papers would be given to that person and they would immediately send them to us for the 86 forms. So you had mentioned two of the lists already, a White House personnel list, a Secret Service list. What other kinds of lists were, were used to cross-reference uh, uh, names well, or to check? Excuse me, but in the beginning that would just be those two, those two places because we wouldn't have had a directory yet at that at the So those would have been the list that, that uh, that you had used. Uh, uh, the, uh, the payroll list, would that be what you would call the White House personnel list or? Oh, no. <laughs> no, that would have been uh, completely different. No, the White House gets a piece of paper. We called it a blue sheet that was filled out with every person. And we had to have that sheet and to do then the cross check. If the people had been coming in on access, then we could cross check with Secret Service. 
but we had a sheet on everyone. We had to have that vital information in order to do a name check. You'd have to have the date of birth, place of birth, social security number, and their current address. We couldn't do anything without that. The, the, the FBI wouldn't do a check without that. Mrs. Gemmel, could you answer what kind of lists were, were available to your office of uh, those who were currently on the, on the payroll of the White House? Normally, ma'am, once again, the primary source for the update project was always the list from Secret Service, provided by Secret Service. Um, there was, not during the current administration, but during previous administrations, what we commonly referred to as the staff book. That was a list of names that was compiled by a security consultant. It could be used as a double check, a reference check source, but again, not as the primary source. When you say that something didn't exist, what were you referring to? The staff book. This, would this be what uh, didn't exist or is? Uh, no, ma'am. The staff book actually was a list of individuals by department within the White House complex and their past types. And this, this executive office of the president, what would you call this, this listing? That would have been the telephone directory. And you would not say that this would be a, the kind of guide that, that you would use or, or it would be? Uh, no, ma'am. Actually, that would have been a very incomplete document from our standpoint because it would not have had the names, for instance, of all the resident staff, all the GSA staff, all the, you know, extraneous entities such as the stenographer reporting form. Thank you. Mrs. Danauer, would, would you say that your job was a, was a glamorous job or, or it, it uh, required a lot of uh, uh, hard, detailed work, didn't it? Well, I can only say that I, it was very low-key as far as the rest of the, of the White House was concerned. A lot and of people... And can you offer then your opinion on why uh, Mr. Livingstone would be so interested in this job during the time that you... Uh, uh, overlapped with him at the White House? I would have no idea because the paperwork alone makes people think twice before they even look in our office. So I don't think anybody really, and I'm sure that the council will, ag council will agree with me that nobody really, really is looking for that job when they So it's, it's peculiar to you why expired. anyone would have such an interest. Indeed. Yes. General Lady's time has expired. Yes. Uh, I'm now pleased to recognize the General Lady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for four or five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the President has declared the gathering of FBI files on hundreds of Republicans, some of them top-level advisors, to be inexcusable. And he has apologized to everyone who would listen. Uh, we must learn uh, today whether this was indeed a bureaucratic snafu or an unauthorized, overzealous abuse of power by low-level White House staffers acting on their own or something most sinister. I, I would uh, agree with my distinguished colleague, Mr. Lantos, who called earlier that the individuals involved should be fired. I share the outrage that the President has expressed to the American people over uh, <coughs> this mistake, and, and it's inexcusable. But today I, I get the unmistakable sense that uh, many on the other side of the aisle and a few of the witnesses at the table this morning believe that the incident under review today was uh, politically motivated, an effort to dig up dirt on uh, Republican members, uh, 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 Republican uh, officials. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, that is a predetermined conclu conclusion and, and not a statement of fact. I, I would think that to support such a sweeping and dramatic conclusion, they would point uh, to a tight chain of circumstantial evidence that inevitably leads to a conclusion. The evidence we have so far is a military uh, detailee requested, and this detailee should be fired, in near perfect alphabetical order, names of staff running from A to G. And I, I have the list here, I have a list of uh, 341 people that uh, the gentleman requested, and on this list is Helen Abdu, Douglas Adair, Joseph Adjin, uh, Richard Alvarez, and you go through 19 names before you get to a name that I recognize, which is James Baker. 
then you go through a hundred more before I get to another name uh, that I recognize, and uh, that's uh, Marlon Fitzpatrick. And uh, I, I would like to th think that if this was a political operation, they would have had uh, maybe Mr. Gray's name on it, <laughs> or maybe. Uh, with me. Pardon me. I said they appear to have stopped with me or Wendy Graham just above me. <laughs> But you're, well, it, it would have been, maybe been on an alphabetical list, but, but uh, if, in, in other words, they wouldn't have gone through 300 uh, people that, that nobody knows uh, to check on them. And if, uh, if some high-level White House uh, politico was running an uh, operation, wouldn't they go directly to some names like uh, John Sununu or Don Regan or, or other such people? And isn't it because uh, there was no such operation that Sununu, uh, Reagan, and Mr. Gray, and others were not at the beginning of the al alphabet, and, and, and therefore were not requested. And I, I believe that this explanation stands more uh, with a terrible bureaucratic uh, foul-up, uh, snafu, than a sinister uh, conspiracy. Uh, but then I do not start with a predetermined uh, conclusion, like some of you at this hearing. Um, in... in uh, in the documents here, I have this one document that uh, was executed on June 9th of 1996, and it was signed by Anthony Maser Mas Marcisa. And in it, and I quote, and I want to put it in it, he says, and he talks about his work and what he did with these files. And he says, there were only three files that I reviewed in the course of the update project that I delivered for Mr. Livingston's review. To the best of my recollection, none of these files were former high-ranking Reagan or Bush administrative officials, such as, and he leaves names out, my re recollection, recollection is that one of the individuals in involved worked for the General Services Administration, one worked for the telephone company, and, and one was a groundskeeper. And uh, that's his, his, his evidence that he put forward. Well, that doesn't sound like a, uh, an operation to get information on uh, politically active Republicans. But I do have with me part of the FBI file on Patricia Schroeder, which she gave me. And in her file, uh, someone broke in her home, and uh, she was uh, put on a terrorist list uh, because of uh, her terrorist affili affiliation as Sandinistas Marxist-Lenin, and she was a, quote, agent of influence. But the most comical part in here is a, uh, a report by someone who's in her home who's trying to find out if she's associated with the Socialist Workers' Party or not. And as proof that she might be, he puts in this campaign button he took, she wins, we win, Schroeder. So this is part of her FBI file. And uh, that seemed more of an effort to, to get dirt or, or to discredit someone. By the way, I've ordered my own FBI file. I think every member of Congress should uh, maybe take a look at, at, at uh, what's in these, these files. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to try to correct uh, one statement that I believe um, uh, was erroneously made. Um, earlier, you stated that the committee na never asked for Mr. Billy Dale's FBI background file. Uh, but I have the uh, committee's subpoena to the White House that asked for every scrap of paper in the White House related to Billy Dale, and I'd like to put that uh, subpoena into uh, the record. I'd like to ask Mr. Graves one question. Uh, do they keep files on all, this is just a personal question, uh, on all uh, members of Congress? Do they keep FBI files on all members of Congress? I have no idea. You'd have to ask the FBI that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but if, and if I could just make a comment briefly about your earlier remarks. There are some people probably that I don't know on this list, but a great many of them are known uh, to those who are active um, in, 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 in politics. It, in many ways, it's a list of the next generation of Jim Bakers. And um, I believe that if you'd read uh, just two or three paragraphs into the FBI report, I don't care who you are, you'd figure out that this was not someone permanently employed at the White House. Penalty's time has expired. If I may respond to only uh, because he did, did raise a uh, an important point. I, I did read through the file, and I, don't, I really do not know any of the people on the list, and I, I would venture to say you probably don't either, with the exception of the two names that I mentioned. And uh, as, he, as he mentioned, 
Uh, the one was time a telephone has operator. That's not the your future, James Baker. Ms. Wani, I would introduce you. I would introduce you. The, you, introduce you. the gentleman's time has expired. Okay. Thank May you, I introduce Mr. you to Mr. Kovahaus, who is uh, on the list that you might be interested in meeting. Uh, let me just say this, that I hope that uh, those of you who request your background files from the FBI uh, are prepared to wait a considerable amount of time because I'm told that they're now working for requests from 1992. Uh, so it may be a while before you're able to get those uh, files. Livingstone and get them a little faster. Can That's I? true. <laughs> That's an excellent suggestion. I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. McHugh, for Thank five you, Mr. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to follow up on a couple of questions that, quite frankly, I'm still unclear on. Uh, the first is, uh, just for my own satisfaction, how unusual is it from uh, the distinguished panel's experience to engage the services of an outside detailee, uh, even forgetting for the moment this was a proven Democrat Democrat uh, operative, one with a great deal of investigative uh, experience apparently, but to engage an outside detailee to engage in this process in previous administrations. Unusual, common, somewhere in between. We didn't. Well, sir, I can only speak for the administrations where I uh, served, and we had no outside agency detailees in our office. Now, that's not to say they might have been in some other offices. I have no knowledge, of course. But uh, they are, I know from the past, they are traditionally used in some offices, but not in our, never in our um, security office. No, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Danahauer, earlier in response to a question, you said that had you become aware of inappropriately requesting a file, you would have immediately returned it. And I believe you said, but that didn't happen. Did it I did. hear you correctly? And through all the administrations you served on, you never had a situation with an inappropriately obtained file. I don't see how, I, no, nothing in my, my, brings it back to my memory because we had all these safeguards. We only asked for the things that we were already working on. We had a reason for it. We would tell the FBI what that reason was. So we wouldn't want anybody else's file. Why would we? I mean, we were, we were working on staff. We were working on presidential appointees. That really energizes enough work in, in, in that office that we would not have even accepted another one, even if there had been a mistake. But there was no mistake. Thank you. M Mr. Gray, you noted that it was your understanding the FBI had advised the White House during this process of supplying the files that no name checks were being done on these people. Could you, for someone who's not familiar with the process, what should that have told the White House was happening? What does that mean when you say no name checks are occurring? That they were asking for these files with no apparent um, reason to do anything with them in terms of getting uh, the individual involved cleared for access to the White House. Because in order to clear anyone on that list of 400, you would have had to do a name check at least to update, to bring forward, uh, the, you know, fill in the missing years between that person's last date of service. And, and, and if they weren't doing that, then what were they doing with the file if they were not updating it? So from your experience, if this was a bureaucratic snafu, the FBI's notification of the White House that no name checks were occurring should have been a clear message that something was awry and amiss and that they should follow up and see what was going wrong, and yet they failed to do that. Is that a fair statement? Well, a clear message. I don't want to get into the uh, qualitative. Uh, it, it certainly is a signal that something was a little unusual. Uh, thank you. Ms. Ms. Gimmel, you noted in a, in a previous, previous question that you saw what you believe to be the list provided by the Secret Service. You then noted you didn't hand that over to anyone because you didn't know who was going to be performing this function. Is that correct? That is correct. The list that you saw, to the best of your recollection, that, does it correlate to the names we have seen out here? Did that list comprise over 400 names of Republican uh, Republican employees of the White House from the past administrations, or was that a totally different list? Do you recall that? Sir, to begin with, the particular portion of that list that would have housed these names 
was not being worked on, but the actual size of the list would have been far greater than 400 names, sir. For an example, it would have also included all of the staff members serving at Office of Management and Budget, Office of Administration. In other words, it would have included all of the executive office of the presidency offices. So it would be your impression then that the list that we're dealing with now, the 400 plus names, at least that's what it is for the moment, was a, to be charitable, a refinement of the Secret Service list that you were familiar with. There may have been other lists, I understand that, but the Secret Service list you were familiar with. Yes, sir, 400 names would have been just a portion of that huge printout received. And not in the, and not in the disposition, in other words, not by office, but strictly alphabetical, which is contrary to how those lists are supplied to. Is that correct? Yes, sir, the breakdown of the list is by division first and then alphabetical within the division. So this bureaucratic fumbling was, from your perspective of, of winnowing down the list from what you feel are thousands to mere hundreds, was it bumbling a rather artistic effort to direct some very specific inquiries on some very specific people that just remarkably happen to be Republicans A through whatever. Is that a fair statement? I really feel that I can't comment, sir, since I wasn't there. Would you, would you disagree with what I said, not agree with it, forget it? Would you disagree with that as a theory? Not in totality, no, sir. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's, gentlemen's time is expiring, and now I'll be pleased to recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Sanders, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just would like to make a brief statement, and that is that this is clearly a very serious matter whether it was a bureaucratic mistake or a politically motivated one. Uh, Americans have a right to privacy, and FBI files contain very serious, private, and possibly derogatory information that individuals would not want to be read by anyone not needing the information for security purposes, and certainly not by politicos who uh, may have the potential to leak that information to the press. It is my understanding that they contain medical files, credit history, and interviews with family members and close friends. They document sensitive issues about someone's history that is nobody's business but their own. And I am very concerned that competent procedures and security personnel may not be in place at either the White House or the FBI to protect these sensitive files. I hope these hearings point out where the problems lie and we can ensure the public that their privacy will be adequately protected and this abomination will not happen again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Mr. Sanders. I'm now pleased to recognize uh, the gentleman from California, Thank Chairman you, of the Mayor. Mr. Manager. Chairman, uh, I think as we've listened to this and we've read the papers and we've read some of the briefings, it's very clear that there's a breach of trust of the citizens of this nation who serve their country when their most sensitive personal history is perused for seemingly political purposes. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have my statement put in the record at this point. Without objection, so pursue ordered. some of these questions. As I understand it, the Secret Service has briefed several members of the other body that they've checked and there were no glitches in their computers and that these lists of White House personnel were always available. So it was easy to cross-check the list we're talking about versus who's involved on the White House personnel that needs clearance to get into the White House. I'm concerned, uh, my staff director of the committee, subcommittee I chair, Government Management Information Technology, Russell George, happens to be on that list. He was a Bush White House appointee. And so uh, my uh, colleague from New York who mentioned that list, there are a lot of people whose names we recognize on that list, and they have been involved in politics and particularly in service to their country. Now, as I recall the numbers, and I've watched this from Eisenhower up, there's generally 3,000 presidential nominees that the president nominates. There's 300 that they seriously work with, and the counsel's office, I'm sure, is involved. As I said the other day, I think personally the president ought to sign the list, not go through every file, but sign the list that goes to the FBI on a request for files. I have worried since well, I guess since I came to this town in the late 50s, I wasn't worried about Eisenhower. I was worried about most people since in terms of the groupies they get on the White House staff that might like to go and see what this operative is doing or that operative and that uh, the degree to which they have access to these files. And I'm really amazed, very frankly, that the White House counsel didn't put their name on it with a signature. I think that's minimal. 
uh, that uh, not just typed forms should be going to the FBI, but somebody ought to look at that list in the council's office and get your signature on it and not your secretary signing your signature, which we know happens on the Hill as well as happens in the executive branch. And I guess I will ask you, would you have known, any of you that were in the White House, if the President of the United States requested an FBI file or his chief of staff, they didn't necessarily have to go through you. They could pick up the phone and say, I'm the president. I'd like to see that file. I'm the chief of staff. I'd like to see that file. How do you make sure that all of those requests went through your office? We had a rule, uh, which I think <coughs> we inherited uh, from uh, previous administrations, that no one in the White House, of course, the, I suppose the president could do it, but no one else in could, the White yeah. House, uh, certainly not the chief of staff, could go and talk to the Department of Justice and certainly not to the FBI without going through us. And we, in turn, would have to go through the Attorney General of the Office of Legal Counsel of the Associate Attorney. There were rules about who we could talk to and who we couldn't. We couldn't, I couldn't even, and never did talk to the FBI except through the established channels that we had for uh, the spin unit or whatnot. So well, let's put the question this way. Do any of the five of you know of requests for files by the President of the United States, any of them for with whom you served, or the Chief of Staff to the President, which the requests were made outside of the council's office? No, sir. No, no. Sir. no. I'm not aware of any. And You're I'm, not aware. And I'm sure we would have been advised by the FBI if there had been such a request. Yeah. No, sir. No. No, sir. No. All right. So uh, at least in the period you served, which is essentially the Johnson administration up here, isn't it, uh, as I remember, through Bush? And uh, it seems to me you can at least based on your knowledge. Now, we haven't heard from the FBI, and I guess my next question is, did the FBI ever request the return of any of these files? That any of your files that you had taken? In other words, as Mr. Kanjorski found out, once those files go to the White House, they're not a copy of the original file. They're a copy of the summary of that file. Now, I take it the summary is made by the FBI That's and right. then sent over. So none of you have really gone over to check what the raw data was versus what the FBI said the summary was. On very rare occasions, we, we would look at the raw data. Okay. Uh, the, 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 with one exception, on judicial nominees, uh, which go through a slightly different process, you do get all the raw data. Uh, it is our, my experience that the summary would, get, would contain any derogatory information, and that's what we would often go back and ask. I'm sorry, more the summary would do what with derogatory? It would contain all derogatory, all derogatory, derogatory information. information. Okay. Uh, I, I'd be very surprised if that got edited out at all. Uh, and also, in terms of what happens to the files, I think the Presidential Records Act literally requires those files to go to, to, to the, uh, the presidential library. It, it is all-inclusive. When a president leaves office, the White House, is, there's no paper with writing on it left. Well, and that's probably a flaw in the uh, Presidential yeah. Records Act. I, I'm sympathetic to a lot of that. On the other hand, when you've got a, quote, permanent, unquote, staff that has worked there from 5 to 10 to 15 to 30 to more years, I don't know why those personnel files, if you would, are not left for the president that comes in. Now, if the president comes in, as you know, they're free to fire anybody they want. These are pleasure appointments. But generally, they keep people with competency between administrations. This administration seems to have dipped down more than most. But uh, generally, those people that are the gardeners, the head usher, head ushers come and go, of course, we know too, in a few cases. But uh, generally, those people are the people who make that place run. And it isn't the OMB top officials or the White House top officials. I can see taking those files, or I can see sending them back to the FBI uh, in either case. But uh, I guess I'm worried that, A, you're looking just at summaries. I, I would want to see more if I was reviewing somebody, and you're saying they do do for judges. But I sure want to see it for cabinet officers. If they were in my cabinet, I'd want to look at that file. And in previous administrations, the Eisenhower administration, which I served, I know that when a cabinet secretary had a question on something, he went over to the FBI to look at the file. The file was not sent over. And uh, sometimes the secretary was right and the FBI was wrong. Gentleman's time has Thank expired. Uh, and I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Barrett, for five Thank minutes. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ms. Collins, I want to thank both of you for holding these hearings. I think it's extremely important that these hearings be held. Uh, this is a 
this is a serious matter, and I think one of the appropriate roles for the Government Reform and Oversight Committee is to hold a hearing on exactly this type of issue uh, to find out what the problem was. Uh, I think any time you have this easy access to FBI files that all Americans should be concerned. And I think it's a, appropriate for us to determine exactly why these files were released, and I'm, I'm happy that we're doing that. I think as we look at this, it's, it's a, important to note that the President has, has apologized for this. The President recognizes also that this is a serious matter. Um, Leanne Panetta uh, recognizes it's a, it's a serious matter. I see today that uh, Mr. Panetta uh, announced that the White House is restructuring its personnel security functions um, by incorporating them into the Security Office of the Executive Office of the President. I think that that shows, um, again, that the White House recognizes that this is not a matter to be taken lightly. I think that our role also has to be to find out what, what the reason these files were requested. I think that it's important for our committee to be doing that. And I think equally important, our committee um, should be working aggressively to make sure that this type of mistake does not happen again. Uh, I think, frankly, that the FBI bears a little of the fault as well. I know that the director of the FBI was critical both of the White House and, and his own agency, and I think appropriately so because I think that the FBI has to be mindful of, of the personal liberties of, of our American citizens. Um, Mr. Culverhouse, why do you think you were on the list? Uh, my name starts with a C, and I served in the Reagan and I'm in Bush White House. Mr. Gray, why, why do you think you weren't on the list? Because they went through GO and stopped. They didn't do any GRs, and GRA would have been pretty pretty high at the list, but it's possible Wendy Graham would have been the next uh, person. But uh, they stopped at GO, thank God. Do you, do you think that there are more bad guys that names begin with A through GO than people whose names begin with GR through Z? I have no one, uh, one reporter who I will not identify, uh, this is sort of slightly frivolous, but said, why do you think they stopped at your name? I have no idea. He said, do you think it's yours, yours was the first name that was recognized? And I said, that's very flattering. Eat your heart out, Jim Baker, Ken Duberstein. Uh, <laughs> um, but he said, well, until we know more, why don't you just claim credit? <laughs> but I, I have no idea. In all seriousness, I have no idea why they stopped at G. Mr. Cobos, any reason why you think they went A through G and then stopped at, at G? Well, at this 10 seconds, I accept uh, the explanation that someone recognized that there was a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, what is mystifying to me, however, is why they kept the files if they recognized there was a problem. Uh, uh, I think the, uh, had it not been for the efforts of this committee, uh, at the end of the Clinton administration, whether it's uh, next January or January four years uh, hence, uh, uh, our files would be on the way to the Clinton Library without us ever knowing that they were there. Ms. Danauer, wh why do you think they went A through G? G-O, excuse me, Mr. Gray. I wouldn't have any idea. No, no sir. Ms. Gamel? It doesn't, it's just unexplainable. I would not know. Okay. Any thoughts as to how the A to G mystery occurred? I, no, sir, not at this time. Mr. Hauser? I have no idea. What's mystifying to me is... That's fine. Mic, That's huh? fine. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do, I don't see any sinister motive in, in picking A through G. As I said, uh, if there are people that are, are not popular, I assume there are as many people who are not popular whose names begin with GR um, as begin with, with uh, C. So, so I, I, don't, I guess I conclude from that that, that this could be a, 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 just a screw-up, frankly, uh, in terms of returning the documents. For me, this, this whole issue of whether the White House even in its archives, should hold these documents and have them be made public for 20 years and then er, held private and then released in 20 years. I frankly think that, that we should, as a committee, be looking at that issue. Um, whether it's a Republican White House, a Democratic White House, or Mr. Sanders gets a White House, an independent White House, uh, I think that, that people, just because they have um, wanted access of one form to another to the White House, 20 years later having their FBI files released, I don't know that that's a, an appropriate price for them to pay. And I think I would ask that we would look at that as a, com as a committee. Um, and uh, I, I think friend, that... Uh, ju just, just one point. I, well, we had a discussion about ourselves. We don't know whether the requirements of the Privacy Act uh, would trump the general 20-year release standard under the Federal Records Act. It may be 
that, and, and there's probably experts at the archives who could tell you this, that may be that the Privacy Act requirement would forever protect these records and that they would not be subject to the general 20-year release standard uh, of other White House documents under the Federal Privacy, uh, under the uh, Presidential Records Act. Again, I think it's, if, it's a fair if, I, question. if there was an FBI file on me, which there might be, I certainly would want to make sure that the Privacy Act did trump that. Uh, the, the last question I have, Mrs. Danauer, maybe you can help me with this. H how many records are we talking? Here we're talking 400 people. 400 out of how many have been requested? What, what percentage of the files requested do these 400 constitute? Again, sir, I would not know because I wasn't there. Um, but maybe you were there over a number of years. Sort of, a, maybe you can give me a rough annual. I assume in the beginning of an administration you'd have far more requests on a monthly basis than you would in the third or fourth year. Are we talking 2,000 requests a year? Are we talking 5,000 requests a year, 10,000 requests a year? And I can only, um, I cannot recall, sir, but I did see uh, actually some numbers in the papers about the number of name checks going over to the FBI, and I believe that was reported in the paper. And it had the numbers by month, I believe, I saw. But uh, as far as the lists are concerned, only Secret Service would be able, I think, to accurately Does anybody, that can question. anybody answer that question on the committee? Okay. I yield back my time. Gentlemen's Thank time you. has expired. Uh, I think the record should note that the uh, Director Freeze uh, report did indicate that there was a, an inordinately high number of requests during that period of November, January 94. Uh, I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, my fellow committee members, we have to really go back to see why we're here. And uh, that's because we were looking at uh, Travelgate, which involved the abuse of the FBI and the IRS in the firing of the uh, White House travel employees. Uh, the reason we're here also is we requested um, 3,000 pages of documents, most of which we know exist because of other materials we've obtained, and we've been denied those documents uh, for two years. Uh, I think we had a bipartisan subpoena to get those documents. Uh, we also were in, involved in in uh, passing this contempt, contempt citation on Mr. Quinn, the legal counsel, uh, asking him for the, to produce the documents, which he still has not done. And by way of getting a thousand pages and holding off on this contempt citation, we, uh, we still have two-thirds of the documentation relating to this affair uh, missing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm calling on you again. I'm going to call on the Speaker, and I'm going to bring the matter to the floor of the House that we pursue this contempt citation. Uh, this isn't a matter of national security. Uh, it isn't a matter uh, of national policy. This is a ma matter of abuse uh, within the White House. So uh, I wanted to start with that statement. Then I have some questions. and Let's let me just try to get to the heart of this. First of all, was it right or was it totally wrong for the White House to request these files? Was it right or wrong? I think it was wrong. Wrong. It, it, it's wrong because... That, that was the initial infraction. Is it's that wrong right? because these are not current employees, so there's no justifiable right. basis and, and no consent. Was it, was it unprecedented to request a blanket list like this of former... White House employees. Do any of you know of this ever being done before? Well, Ms. Dannenauer has already testified that hey, it no, never no occurred. No one knows of this ever being done I'm before. not aware of it. All right, no, the sir. other point is uh, the White House at one point said the, so the uh, Secret Service provide the, provided the list. This, you testified, is that Ms. Gemmell, you've never seen a list like this before. This wasn't a Secret Service type list that, that you're familiar with. We did receive a list from Secret Service but this for processing. List, uh, that you may be familiar with, you've not seen anything like this provided on former employees of an administration. No, sir. No, sir. And also, uh, it's unprecedented that access to files in this manner. Did any of you see uh, interns running around or uh, detailees uh, involved in this process before? 
before, uh, again, you testified that you saw this happen in your, how long were you there uh, during the Clinton administration? Until August 13 of 93. So you were also then involved in their initial clearing of passes for the White House. Uh, would that be correct, the security clearances? For the new staff members, for yes, sir. For the new staff members. And did that proceed in the same fashion as, uh, as uh, previous uh, reviews that, w that you were familiar with, or were there? Yes, sir, it did. It did. But this was unprecedented that, in fact, um, there was access uh, by by detailee, well, I want to say interns at this point. Is that correct? Yes, sir. It was the first time occurrence. Okay. Is it standard procedure, Mr. or was it standard procedure uh, to the council here, councils, the uh, former councils, for non White House employees to personally review FBI reports? You, were you ever aware of any non White House employees in the White House reviewing? Uh, any of these? F were you aware of any? No. Were you aware? No, sir. Other than the Secret Service, who reviewed it for presidential security purposes. Secret Service. Were you aware of any? No, sir. The only were thing I might think of is that there there might be another security officer from another agency who had a need for some but limited purpose. White but House non White House personnel within the uh, within the White House. Had you ever seen this no. happen before? Had you ever no. seen this happen? No, this sir. No, sir. Are any of you aware of a, a, a detailee being brought into this process? Were you aware of a detailee ever being brought into this process? Were no, you aware no, of sir. Were you aware of a detailee? Were you aware of a no, detailee? Sir. No, sir. Were you aware of a detailee? Now, if a detailee came in that had this type of political background, would that have been some concern and had access to, uh, you're aware of Mr. Marsika's background, very political, we've now found out. What, what would be your reaction if someone came in like that? Would you have raised some questions about his, his or her access? Well, I would have thought that I would have been responsible for hiring him, and since I wouldn't have hired him, I don't know how I would have reacted if, so I don't. What would you have done, Mr. Culverhouse? I would have told him to go work for the White House Office of Political Affairs and not my office. And what would you have done if you'd seen a person of this background? And certainly somebody would have checked out this person's background, and in fact, if they were coming into this sensitive area. What right. would you have done, right. Mr. Hauser? Been, I agree with Mr. Culverhouse. He would have been better suited for another office within the White House. And, of course, you two weren't in a position, but was that acceptable? Yes, sir. It would not have happened. Yes, ma'am? No, sir. It would not have happened. Finally. Uh, Mr. Culverhouse, Mr. Free said that the FBI was victimized. What about, now I can, I'm chairman of the House Civil Service Subcommittee, I oversee federal employees, whether they're in the White House as political employees or whatever. They have some rights under Civil Rights and Privacy Act. He said the FBI was victimized. Weren't uh, past employees victimized? Weren't you victimized? Uh, and wasn't the Privacy Act victimized? Yes, sir. Thank you. Everyone's time has expired. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I still think that this is primarily a partisan political effort to embarrass the White House and that it, that it has yet to be determined whether there's any real substance to the allegations of malfeasance. In other words, deliberate wrongdoing versus misfeasance, which is simply clumsy incompetence. And I suspect that if the Bush administration hadn't cleared out virtually all the files, but instead had cooperated with the incoming administration, and the way in which the Carter administration cooperated with the Reagan administration during the transition, that this stuff may very well never have occurred. But Mr. Chairman, I need to use my time to settle a score with Mr. Dale. Uh, since Mr. Dale's dismissal is really the raison d'etre for all this stuff uh, that has come to light, had Mr. Dale not been accused of wrongdoing after his dismissal, we never would have gotten into any of this. In the last Travelgate hearing, I implicitly accused Mr. Dale of the crimes for which he was indicted. His daughter followed me down the hallway after that hearing. 
I was not responsive to her because I would assume that any daughter would defend her father under any circumstances. Um, but last week I was on a TV debate show, one of these, uh, what, CNN things, that, with Mr. Dale. And uh, afterwards he uh, confronted me in uh, what I guess you'd call an intense and personal way. He was obviously very angry. Uh, but what struck me was not so much the intensity of his anger as the fact that it was the reaction of somebody that has been falsely accused. I lay out that context to explain why I didn't make the effort to contact uh, other people that perhaps I should have uh, until last week. I have just assumed that what I read in the papers and have been provided in terms of background material was sufficient. But uh, I have subsequently talked to people over and under and around Mr. Dale uh, uh, while he served several administrations. And as a, a result, I've come to the inescapable conclusion that, uh, in fact, Mr. Dale is an honest professional uh, who was, in fact, falsely accused. Uh, I, uh, I say that because it needs to be said, and, and others, in fact, have said it and have not uh, been heard. Uh, and most of the people that I've talked to, I have to say, are actually Democrats, uh, many of whom worked for the uh, Carter administration. Uh, I do think that since being accused, Mr. Dale has uh, pursued his intent to seek vengeance on the Clinton administration uh, with remarkable success. Uh, but I'm not sure that most of us would not have done the same under similar circumstances. Uh, so since that's the source of much of our hearings, I uh, feel there's only, it's only right to say what I believe now to be the case. Now, since I have a little time left, uh, let me ask Ms. Gemmel particularly if the explanation that we have heard, basically that these two folk, Mr. Marcisa and Mr. Livingston over him, uh, were given information that the list, the Secret Service list, which was deficient in terms of background summary FBI file information, uh, was available and apparently was available in this vault. Uh, is it not possible that uh, without any intent to do wrong, they accessed this list and went about filling in these forms because people who were both on the active and inactive list were on this list, uh, that the Secret Service initially had put together. Uh, the, that is their explanation, that they learned of this list and that, in fact, the reason they were assigned to doing it was that we had far too many people who had access to very sensitive information who had never been adequately investigated by the FBI, and so they were told by Mr. McLarty get on the stick, get these files filled out. We can't have all these people running around without clearance having been provided. And this was just part of that effort, although it was much too inclusive a list, uh, and uh, it, much, many of whom uh, were inactive people. The list that then we subsequently get was a list that had been uh, where these people who never should have been looked into uh, were called uh, by the person that came in afterwards, a Clinton person, uh, to correct this, and that was given to the to the Clinton to the excuse, excuse me to the committee. Now, that's their explanation. Can you tell me that that is not 
possibly true? Is there any reason to believe that that could not have been the case, been the explanation for all of this? The witness can respond, but the gentleman's time has expired. The only way I know how to respond, sir, is that once again, knowing the young people that were in the office at the time, typing those standard forms, being used as the request forms, I do believe that they would not have had the experience to have the name recognition. The gentleman's time has expired, and uh, let me thank the gentleman for his graciousness and uh, remarks about Mr. Dale. I'm sure Mr. Dale is appreciative of, of that uh, civility on the part of the gentleman from Virginia. May I now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Blute, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to commend you for having these hearings and, uh, in a larger sense, commend you for your steadfastness and commitment uh, to getting to the truth and the issue of the travel uh, office uh, firings uh, and the other issues that have come before this committee. The truth is the raison d'etre of this committee. And that's our job for the American people uh, to provide oversight on the executive branch. And I think under your leadership, this committee has done a very good job in getting to the truth. Um, it seems to me uh, that the issue here is the, and as I think Mr. Culberhouse mentioned, the culture under which you operated your office and your responsibilities uh, versus uh, the culture that existed uh, in the Clinton administration that would allow such a thing to occur. Uh, you clearly, uh, under both Democrat and Republican administration, had a culture of responsibility and a culture of sensitivity to the importance of privacy issues with the materials that you had the, the uh, responsibility to deal with. And unfortunately, it seems that this administration uh, did not set that culture of responsibility, and, and indeed there was a lack of sensitivity to the importance of privacy questions uh, on these important documents. I want to ask uh, you uh, uh, how, and I think it's important for the American people to understand, how these uh, records are used. Uh, you get summary of FBI uh, background uh, checks that are extensive and thorough. Uh, you uh, view them uh, and you make judgments as to uh, about the person that you're reading about. Uh, I wonder if you could explain how uh, you use these documents to make a judgment about whether somebody should get an FBI clearance or not. In other words, is the F does the FBI make uh, the FBI does recommendations? Not make, the FBI does not make recommendations. The FBI does not pass substantive judgment. That is left to us to do. And uh, it differs from administration to administration, from president to president, but basically it's fairly common sense. You see a pattern of, uh, say, drunk driving, you see a pattern of shoplifting, you see um, uh, heavy drug use, and you say, gee whiz, uh, this person probably ought not to be in this job. I, I mean, one could go on for hours talking about it, but it's, it's, it's a common sense sort of walking your way through. Who would you entrust with the nation's secrets? Who would you... Uh, trust to uh, to uh, vindicate the public good and to make your boss look good. I mean, it's it's a fairly straightforward thing. Uh, likewise, Congressman. Uh, uh, as a result of, uh, I mean, we've all made mistakes. And a result of the uh, the ill win indictments, uh, we went back and tried to to figure out where we had gone wrong in approving some assistant secretaries of the Air Force or whatever that uh, that ultimately uh, found themselves in trouble. And, and you, you'll see a pattern. Uh, you'll see a pattern of people not paying taxes on time consistently, uh, a pattern of poor credit records, of, uh, of disrespect for authority, uh, and, and some people that maybe have the right political connections but, uh, but are not the kind of people who ought to be occupying positions of responsibility or ought to be in the same room with the President of the United States or the uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain. And your f feeling is that the information that you're viewing is so sensitive that you would not, I think someone testified, you would not even tell the President of the United States the why you're recommending that this person not be given clearance? He insisted with me, I think on two or three occasions, that I give him a glimpse, not the, the, the document, but I give him a hint of what, of what it was about, and he quickly backed off and said, I don't want to know any more. But that wouldn't be a standard uh, request to... No, and I think I testified that these files were not shared with anyone outside the White House Counsel's Office. <clears throat> and our concern, uh, uh, Mr. Blute, is that when there is a breach of privacy, for whatever reason, that the usefulness of those reports is going to be diluted 
in assisting the president to discharge his functions to staff his administration, and that's a real concern. My other question is, it relates to the personnel matters within that office, within your office. Uh, obviously, uh, Mrs. Denna, Hauer, and others have uh, performed their role admirably and well, um, but that is the responsibility of the, the legal counsel to oversee that entire operation. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Correct. Let me ask you something that was reported recently in Time Magazine. This week, uh, they are reporting that uh, three former Clinton administration staff members have said that Mr. Livingstone had a habit uh, at various uh, cocktail parties and, and other places of insinuating that he had read their security files. Now, I'm wondering what would be your reaction uh, as the legal counsel to the President of the United States, if someone uh, made it known to you that someone within your purview, within your office, who had access to secure files, was speaking of these files uh, in a cavalier way uh, out there, what would be your reaction to that? I would hope that the individual uh, who heard this would have come to me or one of us and said, do you know this is happening? And then I hope I would have fired the person immediately. Would that be a serious uh, breach of the security of your office? Yes, sir. Absolutely. I mean, that would have been just a, I mean, an outright breach of any discussion outside the confines of, uh, of the council's office. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, what we have here is what I said earlier, a culture of, of uh, irresponsibility and a lack of sensitivity to the importance of this, the privacy matters that this office deals with. And I think uh, this report uh, just further exemplifies uh, that lack of responsibility. And I yield back the balance of my time. I uh, thank the gentleman. I'm now pleased to recognize my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Shaka Fatah, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gray, <clears throat> is there any reason, based on all of your experience, to think that the Secret Service um, is a political operation in any way or a professional operation? How would you characterize them? Highly professional. So that if they developed a list that they submitted for any purpose, uh, that would have been strictly professional. The, the makeup of that, that list. That would be my instinct. Yes. Okay, and just based on your impressions and your work and your long experience with the FBI, that that is a professional organization too. Would you Absolutely. characterize them? Highly professional. So, to so that, if we would take from what Mrs. Kamal has said, that this list, let's take, assume that this was the list that the Secret Service had produced. It was placed in the vault. These, um, these uh, new employees came in, they got the list, they sent it over to the FBI, that there was nothing that either the Secret Service did wrong in producing the list or that the FBI did wrong in submitting the reports. It was only the judgment of the White House personnel, Livingston and this, uh, uh, this uh, detailee, that really is in question here. Is, is that fairly correct? Well, You're not I, questioning I, I, either the FBI's role in this or the Secret Service's role? Not the Secret Service, although I still don't understand where the list came from. Uh, but as to the FBI, I think uh, Director Free has said that that um, raised questions in his own report, in Shapiro's right. report. But about you, you said earlier in your testimony that, well, maybe accidentally they, you know, I mean, you, that's understandable. You don't ascribe any, I, I, any no, untoward I, I, motive one way or the to other, either I, those entities. One way or the other, I just now, don't know, sir. But, but Having, now, once having gotten the files, I don't see how they could have read through them and then kept How the FBI, once they have gotten the files, or well, how, how the, the White, White House, House had gotten it. Okay, so that's what I'm saying, is that I'm trying to center in on this. But the real issue here is these employees at the White House, the detailee and Mr. Livingston, and their actions once they had gotten uh, the files from the FBI. Now, and there's been a lot of comments about the fact that they had political reputations and had previously been involved in partisan political activity. Now, many members of Congress have been involved in partisan political activities, yourself, others. You're not saying that as a general course, people who've been involved in politics somehow can't act in professional ways. Absolutely not, sir. I said in my testimony that I'm political in the largest sense myself. Okay. All of so them. it is not because of their political leanings that you question or that we should have some concern about their activities. It's whatever they did with the files. No, sir. I think there's a question about whether you would bring a detailee in from outside, not responsible to the White House counsel, uh, who had a background of being a political operative, which I don't think I have, I hope, sir. Maybe I do. Uh, but uh, as being a political operative uh, in campaign activity and, and whatnot. Okay, so you, the, uh, 
I want to follow this too. So you think that people being involved in political campaigns somehow creates a, a dynamic in which they can't act professionally in a work environment? No, I didn't say that. No, sir. I said that this particular individual, given his background as a detailee, not apparently responsible to the Council of the President, that's what gives you, me... You are aware... That, well, you may not be aware. Let me, let me say that, that here in the House, we have uh, people in the Speaker's office, others who've been detailees from the military and from other operations who are doing important work on behalf of the Congress. People who have, uh, at times, have had political leanings. Uh, most Americans, I guess, at times have had political leanings, may have been active in campaign. I guess the point I'm trying to get at is that the real issue here is not the list that was created by the Secret Service or the FBI creating the files and sending them over or even the political background of these two individuals. That the real issue for the committee, it would seem in our search for answers, is to try to figure out whether anything improper were, was done other than an accidental mistake um, in terms of not having the list updated. Now, whether that was the Secret Service's responsibility to make sure that they had an additional updated list, or whether it was their responsibility, somewhere in the midst of this, there was an outdated list that was being used to, 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 to order these files. But the question becomes is once these files came in, whether anything improper happened, and we'll have to have another panel. Obviously, none of you can comment on that but you all have had a, a great deal of experience. Let me try to ask a different question, because as we beat up on this White House about making this mistake, I'm interested, given your long experience, I guess, Mrs. Grimaud, you've had the most experience of anyone at the table working in the White House. Have you seen any administrations that have been mistake-free? Uh, Mr. Gray, have, did the administration that you worked in, was it oh, mistake-free? No, everybody makes mistakes. Mr. But Carver House, I would... excuse me, Mr. Carver House. Every administration makes mistakes. Did the, did the administration that you worked in, did it make a mistake Absolutely. or two? Absolutely. Okay. Now, because I, I, I think that we all know the answer to that question. And so as we go forward looking at this matter, what we should be, it seemed to me, concerned about, uh, Mr. Chairman, is looking at whether there was any improper use of these files that were mistakenly gotten, and, and it is at least Mrs. Gamal's testimony that she believes that it could have been accidentally, um, an accidental mistake that they were ordered, but notwithstanding that, to see whether there was any, any misuse. And I think that is the question that we need to search for. I want to thank all of you for your uh, participation here today. I know it's been a long day, at least for me. Uh, but I think that as we go forward, we should keep in mind that all administrations have made mistakes it is entirely plausible that the explanation that has been given uh, is, in fact, the, an explanation that is truthful. And as we uh, hasten for, I believe, partisan reasons, uh, as we accuse others of having political motives uh, to beat up on the White House over this matter, we should try to find ways to make sure that everyone's privacy is protected. And there are probably, from this example, better ways to handle this. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. I will now yield to the gentleman of Virginia. May, but he yield to me. Just one question. That is, we, we hear about this uh, Secret Service list uh, that uh, presumably was the cause of all this. Can you tell me, in your experience, how often the Secret Service upgrades or updates the, uh, the pass list for uh, access to the White House? Uh, Jane, I th should... should. How often? I think it's monthly, isn't it? Jack? How often the uh, the uh, White House, the Secret Service list is up, upgraded? In other words, uh, how often is it? Uh, does it reflect the realities of who should have access to the White House? Well, we had the monthly list, and then we had weekly lists. Mm -hmm. But and the list that comes to this office, how for this purpose, how often is that updated? That would probably be monthly, would it not? All right, so monthly list. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Reclaiming my time. Let me just try to focus on this. Well, you talked about a list that might have been uh, left behind uh, that you saw. Could you amplify on that a little bit? How long this list would have been? Would it have been an alphabetical uh, list? Would it have known who was active and inactive? Uh, what kind of information would have been left? Uh, sir, the list was supposed to have been of active personnel only. Uh, it would have been quite voluminous. I have no idea at the number. It would have been a staggering number. You don't see any reason why Mr. Dale's name or Mr. Culverhouse's name would have been on that list, then, do you? No, sir, it should not have been. Okay, thank you. That, I think that clarifies my, uh, 
No question. People who no longer work at the White House and in some cases have been gone for several years should not have been on that list. That Absolutely were. not. Thank you. I think the purpose today, we've tried to show that the practices of the past administrations has not been consistent with what this administration has followed. And I think we have seen that up and down. For testimony about the vault and where these uh, uh, the FBI files were kept, were they kept in the same place under both administrations? All administrations? Yes, sir, they were. So the current administration kept them in the same room that the uh, Bush administration and the Reagan administration kept them? Yes, sir, they did. Okay, that, that clarifies uh, uh, that. We heard from one of my friends on the other side that uh, when he asked Mr. Culverhouse, has this hurt you? What damage have you shown? That's, you wouldn't necessarily know what damage could come from people seeing your file that shouldn't see it, would you? Uh, no, sir, I don't. That's probably uh, yet to be told uh, as, as I live the rest of my career and if I, uh, I have the bad judgment to try to go into government again. Uh, Congressman, the, uh, you know, I, uh, I suspect I'm not a terribly sympathetic uh, figure. I, I can probably take care of myself if someone uses my file. But the people that, that I worry about, I can think of two or three occasions, Dick and Boyden can probably think of others that happened to them where we would be told that someone wanted to work in, in the White House, someone who was qualified, usually a lower level person, maybe uh, a secretary or um, uh, a, a someone with a lot of technical expertise who had concerns about going through the background process. Uh, I can think of a couple of occasions where I counseled people uh, who would reveal things like, and I'm not going to give you the exact situations, they were a recovered alcoholic or they'd gone through a messy domestic situation and had, would have a poor credit report. Uh, we would counsel them that if that's all there it was, if they were forthcoming with the FBI, uh, and if there was nothing else in the record, uh, that they would survive the clearance process, that would only be known to professionals at the FBI, at the Secret Service, only be known to people like Jane Denenauer, my deputy, and me if there was an issue, but I probably wouldn't read it if that's all there was. And that person, in a couple of cases, went through clearance under that representation. It turns out I misrepresented what happened because that person left at the end of the Reagan administration or midway in the Bush administration. But now their file has been reviewed by someone not on the list I gave them. And that, those are the people who are at risk. Those are the people I feel particularly well, bad about. What about somebody being interviewed and you're asking them to be candid and honest? If they knew that this information could be used by other people for other purposes, wouldn't that have a chilling effect on being able to get uh, uh, honest checks in the future as well? Yes, sir. Okay, anybody? Absolutely. Uh, I think that's really the point of this, and we don't know what damage may or may not occur to the, to the current people on the list, but in the future, uh, in terms of the utility of these files, the confidentiality, uh, and their use uh, could be damaged by, by this incident. And I think that's what we have a collective responsibility to try to come back and ensure that this doesn't happen again and try to restore uh, some integrity to the process. The irony here is that the administration claimed executive privilege over these documents originally, particularly Mr. Dale's uh, file, which was what the specific question was. Our question would be, my question would be, at what point uh, does this seem, under your knowledge of executive privilege, to fall under that definition? And you'd want to ask if, if someone in your office uh, had seen this and a document was requested from a committee, would you claim executive privilege on this? You understand, do you understand the question? And in terms of the, of the transmittal form between my office and the FBI, right. just the transmittal form, the preprinted form, I would not have claimed executive privilege because that does not reflect my advice to the president with respect to the nomination process, which I would claim executive privilege. I tend to be executive privilege hawk, uh, much to the dismay of prior uh, congressional committees. Yeah, but I, I mean, that was your job, too, as the president's counsel. That's your job as we, as we move into these. I just think it's important to note that there are still 2,000 documents that we have not seen. Uh, this release of the last one has caused a firestorm with the press and the media and, and, of course, with the committee as well as we start seeing uh, that iceberg as a little bit more of it becomes uh, visible has caused a lot of concern. And, my, you know, we're wondering what the next 2,000 documents fall of which privilege has been claimed. And probably uh, if we see privilege claimed for documents like this, what does this mean for uh, what is left on there? We've also seen that the bureaucratic detailee turned up to be a political operative, uh, that the files that were said they were given to them by the Secret Service may in fact be something far more. And we, it's going to be a very interesting meeting when we find out how this list was obtained. The question to me is not who was on it, but who was off it. 
people actively working at the White House who never uh, got the security clearances, and they uh, seemingly hadn't been requested. Uh, people working there every day, people like Harry Thomason, who was working in and out every day, and as far as we know, never received the appropriate clearances or checks. So I yield back. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. McIntosh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I've got an opening statement that I'd like to put into the record. If Without I objection, may. all members' opening statements will be included as part of the record. Let me say, I think the real question that needs to be addressed today that has been overlooked to some extent is, in recent months, has there been an attempt to cover up the fact that these White House, these files were at the White House? And I think we need to ask ourselves and, and ask appropriate officials, it, when did senior White House and Justice Department officials first learn of the existence of these White House files, uh, FBI files in the White House? Was it June 6th when they began returning them? Was it May when they asserted executive privilege? Was it February when they met with Chairman Klinger? Or was it earlier? And when did they know about that? What did they know? And what did they decide to do about it? Now, the first part of this issue, I think we need to focus on exactly when the files were sent back. Um, my understanding is that 338 of them were sent back in June 6. One more file relating to travel gate was sent on June 10th. 71 additional files were sent on June 13th when the FBI issued its report condemning the White House for the way it handled this matter. But I also understand there's still 17 files when you add up all the numbers that have not been sent back, according to the FBI's list of how many files they think were sent over to the White House. The second issue, and this relates to executive privilege, and I would like to ask our witnesses, um, either you know, any of the former counsels to the president, while you were serving as counsel to the president, you've mentioned that the issue of executive privilege came up. And I wanted to ask you, were you familiar with the Reagan Memorandum concerning executive privilege? And, that, and Mr. Gray as well. Was that memorandum followed after 1982 when it was put into place in, in every instance where there was an issue of executive privilege and whether it should be asserted? We followed it. Uh, absolutely, Congressman McIntosh. Yes, yes Mr. It was. Hauser as well. Um, is it correct that in that policy there is a statement that there will not be a, a claim of executive privilege relating to documents that have to do with allegations of credible wrongdoing. That's correct. And is it also correct that under this memorandum the president states that there will only be an assertion of executive privilege when it is specifically authorized and signed personally by the president? That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. And I think it's upon the recommendation of the Justice Department. Now, it is my understanding that the current administration also continues to follow this policy. Um, are you all familiar with that? You may not have any I'm reason not. to know what their policy I, is. I read that they had, but I, of course, you're involved with your own process here. It doesn't appear that they did in, 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 the, in connection with your own uh, contempt proceedings. Well, that's what I want to get into a little bit. In looking at this, there is a letter, and, and Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make part of the record the chronology about the events here, specific, and specifically refer to pages um, that refer to White House withholding of records, where it mentions on February 15th that Mr. Quinn had a meeting with Chairman Klinger, and at that point indicated that they were going to be holding certain documents for various privileges, and that Later on May 9th, Mr. Quinn sent a letter to Chairman Klinger, which I've got a copy of here, and I'd like to also include that in the record, and read from it where he says, consistent with that opinion, the opinion, uh, uh, Reagan opinion on executive privilege, the President has directed me to inform you that he invokes executive privilege as a protective matter with respect to all documents in categories on page three which include the, F, uh, the documents that executive privilege has been asserted over, until such time as the President, after consultation with the Attorney General, makes a final decision to which specific documents require a claim of executive privilege. This letter constitutes your notice that of that invocation of privilege. Now, the question I've got for our witnesses, is there any procedure under the Reagan executive order, which is cited here in the letter, uh, for an assertion of executive privilege where the president has not been informed 
of the matter and not reviewed the documents, but in some sense a protective executive privilege, I think, is the label they put in this letter. I'm not aware of it. Uh, it's sort of like a trial, a trial claim, um, a claim of practice claim of privilege. I'm not aware of the so-called protective privilege. And if there was any indication to say we're, we're intending to exert executive privilege, although we haven't done it, would it, would you have suspect that they would immediately begin reviewing the documents with the president in order to make that determination? And in, in, in our and in my for you, I don't, can't speak for A, B, or Dick, but we, I don't think, um, would have provoked a committee into a committee vote without having a thorough review of the. Um, of the underlying documents. This was a lesson drawn out of the very early Reagan years, and I don't think we would have done that again. Um, but that so, Dick was there. I mean, well, they, in fact, the process that you describe sounds backwards to me. Uh, it was a process that was um, uh, entered into with the Justice Department, where there was a, uh, a review of the documents, and only after uh, there was concurrence uh, by the Department of Justice and the Attorney General and the White House Counsel. The documents were appropriate for an assertion of executive privilege. Would there be a presentation to the president? To the president. Well, it appears to me, since Mr. Quinn's letter asserts the president has authorized him to assert this privilege, and, and assuming he is being forthright in his letter, that there is a real question of, of were these FBI, the fact of this list of FBI files presented to the president? Did the president know that there were FBI files? Uh, did he know that they were still in the White House? Uh, certainly did Mr. Quinn or, or Attorney General Reno know about their existence in the White House, and why was there no action taken to return those files until later in June when the FBI in, became involved in the matter indicating they disapproved of the procedures? And Mr. Quinn, let me call on this committee to hold further hearings to get to the bottom of these questions. I may assure the gentleman from Indiana that we do intend to hold further hearings uh, for that precise purpose. And now I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Gutnick, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, many of the questions that I had wanted to ask have been asked, but I do want to sort of frame this whole issue and because I think we've heard from some of the uh, folks on the other side that uh, you know, no harm, no foul, this is no big deal, it was an honest political mistake, it was an honest uh, bureaucratic mistake, some of those things. Uh, but let me just, in, in fact, our colleague from New York, uh, Ms. Maloney, said that uh, there were no big names on the list, and so it's no big deal. Well, let me just remind the, the committee that uh, Representative Forbes' wife was on the list, 12 congressional aides were on the list, uh, two of our subcommittee staff were on the list, uh, Mr. Culvehouse uh, was on the list, Tony Blankley, the uh, Speaker's press secretary, was on the list. Uh, hardly, any of the, in, hardly anyone in America, I think, believes that uh, this was some innocent list. And more importantly, none of these people were likely to be appointed to high-ranking positions in the Clinton White House. And I guess the question is, why is this important? Why does America care? Why should we care about this? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons. Uh, Benjamin Franklin once observed that reputations are like fine china. They are easily broken and never well mended. And I think from the beginning of history, world leaders have understood the power uh, of having a secret police that could spy on the individuals who lived in, in their kingdom or their fiefdom or their country or whatever. And, and I think it's important for a lot of reasons because there has been a violation of what I believe is a sacred trust of the FBI. Those of us who grew up uh, watching Elliot Ness and the Untouchables on television had this sort of image of the FBI as, as an agency that you could trust. They were the good guys. They fought for truth, justice, and the American way, and that somehow they were working for us. But I think this example demonstrates the tremendous potential for uh, uh, damage to be done to American citizens with a collection of raw data, with, with unprotected ability of certain individuals for political purposes uh, to get their hands on this data, and that ultimately this data could be leaked when it was found to be politically uh, favorable to certain people. Let me just go back and restate what some of the things that we've learned, and I, I feel a little bit like uh, uh, Will Rogers, you know, he used to say, the only thing I know is what I read in the newspapers. And as we reread some of the columns and some of the articles and some of the things that have been put into the national newspapers over the last several weeks, it makes a very interesting story. And frankly, the more we learn, 
the, the more questions that are raised, not only for this committee, but I think for all Americans. For example, uh, in, uh, in the LA Times on June 6th, uh, uh, Mark Fabiani, a White House lawyer, insisted that the information in the files was never seen by White House officials. What we have here is obviously an innocent bureaucratic mistake. And the bottom line is that Mr. Dale's files were not singled out. Well, now we know that's not exactly true. As a matter of fact, the more we learn about uh, uh, Mr. Marseca and, and the other in individuals who were involved in this, uh, they were not low-level, uh, uninformed bureaucrats. I mean, they were hand-chosen. In fact, uh, we, it was quoted in the Washington Post of uh, June 9th of, of this uh, month uh, that Anthony Marseca, an Army civilian investigator who was assigned to the White House Personnel Security Office in late 1993 and early 1994, said he reviewed the files for, quote, derogatory information. Uh, if he found such information, he said he passed it along to Craig Livingstone, the director of the office. And the more we learn about these two individuals, the more questions it raises, not only about this White House, but the, but the way that uh, business was uh, conducted over there. Let's, let's just review what we now know about Anthony Marseca. First of all, we now know that the White House specifically requested by name the assignment of the Army aide who improperly got more than 340. Now we learn it was at least 408. And frankly, I think if we ever get the rest of the subpoenaed documents, I think we'll find that the list is much longer than 408. My own guess is it's more like a thousand because just knowing what we know, to get through G you get to about 400, the rest it might be a thousand names that are on this list. Anthony Marseca is an investigator with the Army Criminal Investigation Division, we know that. Uh, he also had frequent contacts with the, the First Lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton, as well as Vice President Al Gore. This has all been published in the papers or in Newsweek magazine. Uh, he did work for a special committee of the U.S. Senate. He also did work uh, for various national campaigns, including Ed Muskie, George McGovern, and Gary Hart for president. He ran for delegate to the Democratic National Convention several times. These are all published reports. Colleagues remember him as a, a character in dark glasses and a trench coat who enjoyed cultivating a cloak and dagger image. He found as a soulmate, uh, he found a soulmate in the campaign trail in Mr. Livingstone. And who was Mr. Craig Livingstone? Well, he worked on the personal staff of Geraldine Ferraro during her vice, president, vice presidential campaign and was on Gary Hart's staff when he sought the Democratic nomination for president. We know that to be a fact. He worked on Vice President Al Gore's advance team in 1992. Livingstone, Livingstone has no law enforcement background, a former restaurant bouncer. He was on the 1984 Hart campaign when he met ex-cop Marseca. Uh, I think the question that we need to ask about these two individuals uh, from this esteemed panel that's been collected today, would you or your, your folks in your administration have put these kinds of individuals in, in, uh, in charge of very sensitive FBI raw data? Well, uh, I'll take a stab at answering your question maybe for all of us. I think the great contrast that you see between the way backgrounds were conducted in this administration and in our respective administrations was that uh, Craig Livingstone is making the decisions here as opposed to somebody at the level of counsel or, or deputy counsel to the president. And there was a very tri tight control on the operations of the office between the counsel and uh, the individuals who worked in the security office. And I think it's qualitatively very different. Anybody else comment? Would you have put... Uh these kinds of political operatives and in, in, in that kind of a responsibility in your administrations? Uh, no, sir. Uh, Congressman, uh, that, that is not to cast any stones at uh, Mr. Livingstone or Mr. Marcheka. There, there may have been a place at the White House, as I suggested, the Office of Political Affairs or some other place, or uh, the advance team, uh, where they could have rendered good service. But uh, there, there are a number of offices at the White House where you want a different kind of individual with, uh, with a different attitude um, and uh, uh, a reputation for professionalism and discretion. The gentleman's time has expired. And Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter, for five minutes. Personally listening most of the day, it's been a little uh, scary, and I'm sure that some people around the country may be concerned, as you mentioned, about applying for government jobs. But I particularly wanted to talk to Mr. Call the House and, and um, 
I have a line of uh, questioning here. Really, these are kind of yes or no questions. We've heard that uh, drunk driving, uh, drug abuse, shoplifting, maybe some of the things in there, but a lot of the discussion today has kind of laundered this and made these sound like the fairly formal files. And I have some questions about the types of things that could appear in them. And I, I just wondered, for example, in the medical area, could the records show that somebody was HIV positive, which may not be known? Yes. Could it be shown that somebody had been treated for mental health uh, problems? Absolutely. That's a question that's specifically asked. Could it be that uh, somebody could be uh, investigated or have uh, domestic violence, sexual harassment, child abuse charges, even if they hadn't been convicted in court? Yes, sir. Could you uh, have uh, questions and, and allegations in there, uh, which may not even be true, on sexual preference or whether someone was having a marital affair? Yes, sir. This isn't just some kind of financial examination. This is like open season on people's personal lifestyles, on their background, going into the hands of political appointees. Uh, and I know that, uh, Mr. Gray, I, I want to see if this is correct. You said that it could have, uh, it gave you chills to the types of details involved. Is that a proper characterization? And does it indeed, as you, you look at this, give you chills as to where these files might be floating even around interns or political people? Yes, sir. The, um, if, uh, do you view this, given I, I understood uh, at least Mr. Kalvahaus is saying, I think others, that uh, you would not have, uh, you viewed this as a breach, and, and Mr. Kalvahaus is on the list, a breach of the confidence that you had. In other words, you knew that there would be uh, reviews within the administration that you were in. But do you view that as a breach of the agreement with you and a breach of, of privacy and confidence that they appeared in the hands of possibly political people? Uh, yes, sir. I, I've gone through clearance four times. Uh, one as a Senate staffer for uh, uh, nuclear weapons clearance for the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, then the White House clearance process, then Secretary Cheney appointed me to an advisory commission to look at, at, at command and control issues uh, uh, with nuclear weapons. And then the, uh, for the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, to, re to reform the espionage laws. And each time I, I knew that someone would be reviewing my files, but I had a pretty good idea of who those someones were, what kinds of people they were. But never in my wildest dream did I think a uh, White House, uh, 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 I guess, uh, dominated by a political party of, of which I am not a member, would be looking at my file. If a doctor breaches confidentiality, they can be subject to a civil or criminal suit. Do you believe people in political positions who violate that breach should be vulnerable to similar? Congressman, uh, I've reserved judgment on that issue. Uh, uh, I, uh, I would need to know more. Uh, I think if it were uh, knowing, willful, intentional, uh, then uh, the answer is yes. If it were an innocent uh, mistake, although a mistake uh, of, of such magnitude is hard to envision, uh, then probably not. Furthermore, we, as, as Congressman Gutnick has pointed out, we don't even know what magnitude for sure is there. I wanted to insert into the record with a, a brief comment um, that to make it clear there are documents here that, that it was Mr. Uh, Mercisa who in fact uh, requested these documents uh, and I would like to submit these for the record, Mr. Without Chairman. Also in our notes on the chronology on the travel uh, in some of the Cravelgate hearings that the political appointee, the director of the Department of Army, said that Mr. Marcisa is a sound and logical thinker capable of handling any number of critical and sensitive missions at one time. He goes on to say a number of positive things. But there was an interesting line at the end. Do not be dissuaded should the military leadership of the Criminal Investigation Command object to the detail of Mr. Marcisa. If the military command people involved in, in criminal investigation where a person had been had expressed concerns, would that have been a warning flag to you when this person was coming through, if you had been in a, in a similar position in the White House looking at this person? I think so, yes, but I don't really understand what the last sentence means. I, it, it, apparently, he had been uh, involved in directing some agents uh, in the Department of Army and the director of the Department of Army, in effect, was signaling over to the White House that they may have professionals object to this appointment, but he, who was a political appointee, was saying, go ahead and trust that them. Would have, that would have raised the flag, yes, sir. I have um, uh, no more questions. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, 
the panel will bear, we have one more questioner, uh, and he's been very patient and has waited here a very long time, and I don't think he can probably conclude his five minutes before we would have to go vote. So if, if you can bear with us, we'll go vote and come back as fast as we can, and Mr. Lotteret will have an opportunity to ask his questions, and then we'll release you. Thank you all very much. <laughs> We'll continue our coverage of this hearing on access to FBI files in just a moment. Right now, some programming notes. This weekend on C-SPAN 2, About Books, our new program focusing on authors, ideas, and the business of books. Tonight, highlights from the American Booksellers Association convention in Chicago. At 9 Eastern, an interview with Barbara Bonds Thomas, incoming ABA president. At 9.30, Art Buckwald and other authors. Turning to tomorrow night, more from the Booksellers convention. At 9, an interview with John Ingram of Ingram Book Company. At 9.45, remarks by Andrew Young and other authors. About books, Saturday and Sunday nights on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. Now here's the final portion of this hearing on access to FBI files. The House Government Reform and Oversight Committee began hearings to examine how the White House obtains background files from the FBI. The uh, committee will resume its sitting, uh, and when we broke for the uh, vote on the House floor, uh, we had reached uh, Mr. La Tourette as the final panelist uh, for his questions. Our cleanup hitter, Mr. La Tourette, is, uh, is here, and as soon as we have our witnesses in place, I will recognize Mr. La Tourette for uh, five minutes. Here they come. <laughs> the chair will now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latourette, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's humid outside, I would note, for the record. Um, Mr. Chairman, I want to add my voice in, in praise uh, of you and the ranking member in this case for scheduling this hearing. I think a number of us on the committee uh, might be chomping at the bit to talk to Mr. Livingstone or Mr. Marseka, but by providing this panel today, uh, I think that you've given uh, the members of the full committee the opportunity to see how this procedure was handled in administrations dating from the Johnson administration through the present. And, and for that, I, uh, I would uh, uh, comment that you and, and Mrs. Collins deserve credit and praise. One of the great advantages of sitting uh, in this place in the dais is that when it gets to be your five minutes, you've heard all of the collective wisdom of your colleagues, and uh, there, there aren't a whole lot of issues uh, left, and you do get, in fact, to bet clean up. I, I do want to comment that uh, uh, I think everyone on the committee recognizes the serious and sensitive nature that are contained in these, these FBI files. I, I can remember in 1992, February of 1992, I had a good friend back in Lake County, Ohio, who was nominated by President Bush during your tenure, Mr. Gray, uh, to a, a federal bench appointment. Uh, and uh, they not only had to complete the, uh, the form, but also the FBI probed into his background. And I'll, I'll never forget, I was the prosecutor at the time, and the judge came upstairs, and he would go to Columbus for judicial conferences. I would go to Columbus to, to be a member of the Ohio Prosecuting Attorneys Association. And he said, you're not going to believe what they're asking about. And not only the issues that Mr. Souter of Indiana raised earlier, but uh, he cautioned that they had pulled the records from the hotel where we stayed and found out what kind of movies he watched when he was alone in his room at night and, and cautioned me never to watch Bambi Goes to Congress or anything like that uh, next time I was down in Columbus. I do want to uh, ju just follow up on, on some things that have been mentioned during the course of testimony. Several of you have mentioned the Privacy Act during the course of your testimony, and specifically I, I believe that that refers to the Privacy Act of 1974. And I would ask those gentlemen who have been uh, counsel to the president or in the counsel's office 
uh, it's my understanding that, that the Privacy Act of 1974, in addition to providing civil remedies for people who are uh, aggrieved due to the release of information, is also a penal, a criminal statute, uh, and indicates that there may be a criminal sanction for not only people who willfully or knowingly release information, uh, but also for people who make the request. Is that all of your understanding as well, that it's six months, 5,000 bucks is, a, is the penalty for that, that type of infraction? Tell you the honest truth, I'm not uh, an expert, uh, expert on the uh, uh, penal provisions of the, of the Act. Okay. I, ba based upon your time in, as, as counsel, again, any of you that have served as counsel, are any of you aware of an exemption for uh, the willful uh, distribution of information collected, um, private files? No, sir. Not for, not for willful distribution. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Gamel, I, I want to uh, go back to something that Mrs. Morella of Maryland was asking you earlier, and that has to do with I believe you not only said students uh, or interns, but also students, and you described them as being in the 18 to 20-year-old range uh, working in this particular office. Is that right? To the best of my knowledge, yes, sir. That and would have been their approximate ages. Okay. And, and, and this only occurred uh, during the time that you were there, sort of in the, the holdover between January and August during the Clinton administration? That is correct, yes, sir. It never occurred in any administration that you'd worked prior to that? Absolutely not. Where, where, did, where did these people come from? These, uh, who are these? But, I mean, can you just go to the White House and say, I want to volunteer, and they, they put you down in the, uh, in the secured personnel room? And how does a volunteer get to volunteer down there, do you know? I really do not know whether these young people were personally known to Mr. Livingstone or not. You also mentioned that, that if you had to look uh, from the outside in as to how this transpired, there would have been a, a lack of name recognition. And by that, I, I took it to mean that when they were typing the forms, these 18 to 20-year-old students and volunteers, they may not have recognized James Baker or, or uh, some of the other people on the list. You, you did not mean to suggest that Mr. Livingstone or Mr. Marseka, uh, gentlemen who have a long time involvement with the political process, that wouldn't have known those individuals. You, you didn't mean to say that. Absolutely not. Okay. I, I want to, uh, to uh, uh, talk about something that was talked about at the very beginning, that there are three reasons why the White House might suggest information from the FBI. And name checks was the first one. That's sort of like running somebody on the leads machine to see if there's a hit for a, a criminal violation or a, a, a traffic ticket. The full field investigation, that's the Form 86. And then updates on semi-permanent that are done on a four-year basis, if you recall that, that set of testimony. And I, I want to focus on those, those four-year updates. Is would, would that, if someone, say a clerk, from the Bush administration was held over into the Clinton administration, a non-political appointee, someone who had worked in the White House for 10, 15 years. Is it my understanding that their FBI file would be updated every four years? Is that the procedure? Okay. So when the Clinton administration came in, or any new administration came Just in... Just so that we get the record, if you could respond... Oh, I'm sorry. ...verbally so that we have it on our record. I'm sorry, sir. Yes, sir. That is the case. Okay. And, and, and so when uh, a new administration would come in, uh, all those non-political appointees that would be subject to a four-year review, you'd, you'd make a request of the FBI that we need to see those, we need to have those files here so that when their four years comes up, we're going to tickle them and, and we're going to have you give us an update of what they've been doing uh, since our last review. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We kept a log, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, then we would by, month by month go through the lists. The lady, all the ladies would do that and um, make sure that they got the 86 form and we would proceed with the four-year update. Okay, and, and, and as you went through month by month, uh, let's say that uh, you had an individual who was hired in the middle of, uh, of President Bush's term, so two years, that, that, that you'd have something to tell you that two years into President Clinton's term, you'd have to do an update, is that right? We would if he were kept on, yes, sir. Uh, That's right, if they were still at the White House. Yes, sir. Uh, can you recall, uh, either of uh, you ladies at the end, any time during your tenure with all the administrations that you served, that somehow that four-year review, four review process of held over employees was expedited for any reason? That you'd Not review them after knowledge. a year? No, sir. It was a very routine, very routine and very voluminous job, and so we would adhere very closely to what we had to do. I mean, Ms. Gamal, can you recall any such instance? I could only reiterate what Ms. Dannenauer said. Okay. So, so neither of you, to your knowledge, and again, we're going from the Johnson administration uh, through, this, uh, through the end of the Bush administration, can recall a time where you would have been requested by a, a supervisor to expedite a four-year review for a, a held-over uh, employee, someone who uh, uh, perhaps stayed from another administration? No, sir. Okay. 
Thank you very much. I, in my, my last time remaining, I want to focus on the FBI because there have been some observations that, that uh, it's perhaps it's these two political operatives that were put in charge and they're the ones to blame and, and only to blame. Uh, were, were any of you gentlemen or, or you ladies ever refused a request made to the FBI? In other words, does the FBI have any responsibility at all when they get one of these forms with the counsel's name typed in to question or, or ask a question as to why the heck are you guys or you gals asking for this information? Well, sir, I, I can just answer that by saying whenever we made a request, we had a reason on that request. And if they, uh, well, they just wouldn't question it if it were a name check, a full field, or the, or the copy of the, of the uh, previous report. And that's what, that's what we asked the Bureau for. And would, would it be we fair? always had a reason, sir. Okay, and, and would it be fair just to, to restate some of the testimony that we've heard throughout the course of today? that with this list that we're talking about today, none of you can think of a legitimate reason for the request by the White House to the FBI for these 408 personnel files? No, sir. Nobody? No, sir. No. No, sir. Th thank you very much for your patience, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Latret. Now I have to announce to the panel that I lied to you. Uh, there is, no in fact, a, another clear. member who has uh, arrived from a budget uh, committee meeting, and I would like to recognize the gentleman from Connecticut. Today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First off, I, I think both sides have established their positions, and I understand the panels have done a very good job of responding, and you've set the the foundation for future hearings. I just wanted to say for the record, I consider this an extraordinarily important hearing and appreciate your participation. Uh, I was, in fact, at a budget committee in which we voted out uh, welfare reform and Medicaid reform. And I feel particularly um, uh, um, impelled to say that because as someone who participated on the HUD investigation, and Mr. Gray, as you realize, because the White House cooperated fully with Mr. Lantos. And this committee, when we looked at abuses by a previous administration, and we in the minority then, the Republican minority, cooperated fully with the Lantos hearing. Mr. Kemp, Secretary Kemp, cooperated fully. The White House cooperated fully. And there could have been a temptation to say this was a witch hunt. But we were in a hunt for the truth. And I just want to say for the record, I consider this hearing uh, of the same stature. Mr. Klinger has been working for years patiently. He hasn't gone before the press uh, and except at extreme moments. He has allowed the White House more than ample time to, to cooperate, and they didn't. Uh, we were forced at a hearing to actually hold the White House in contempt, and only then did we get the list that we had been requesting. And it turned out to be not a list of seven people, but a list of 400, and we know why it, it was basically a cover-up. So anyone who has followed this knows there has been a cover-up, and we are simply looking to get the truth. And I have never, ever found a chairman who has been more patient in his effort and has been less abusive of power totally responsible. And I just, I wanted to be on the record on that point as someone who participated with another member of this committee on what was called the Lantos hearings. We in the minority cooperated fully, and we need that same cooperation from this minority. And I just uh, thank the gentleman for allowing me thank to put you. that on the record. Those kind words, you need any more time. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you all very, very sincerely for your appearance here today for the excellent testimony you've given. I think we've made a very good record as to what transpired in earlier administrations, both Republican and Democratic, uh, in terms of this um, issue of background checks and who controlled them and so forth. We've had a very good discussion, I think, of executive privilege and when and when it, when it lies and when it does not lie. Uh, and uh, you have been very helpful in the information you've given the committee. I can announce that we will hold additional hearings on this matter. I really wanted to use this hearing to sort of establish a base of, of what, uh, what have been the procedures in the past. Now we need to establish were there variances uh, from those procedures that, uh, that occurred in this administration. So we will be looking at that. We also, I think, need to explore the question of this, there's this nebulous list, and it is still not clear in my mind as to where the list came from, uh, how it was uh, ginned up, and apparently the Secret Service is indicating they really couldn't have produced such a list as we've had. So there's a real question here that needs to be looked at. 
I would stress we are not making any allegations of wrongdoing at this point. We are merely trying to get uh, all the facts on the table. We are, I would also close by saying, we have not lost sight of the fact that there are still 2,000 pages of documents that are outstanding with regard to our basic investigation, which has to do with the Travelgate firing, and we will proceed and pursue uh, getting uh, those documents before us as well. So I think we can anticipate there will be a hearing either Wednesday or Thursday of next week to pursue, pursue these matters in more detail. Thank you all very much, and the committee stands adjourned. <laughs> This was the first of three hearings to examine access to FBI files. Chairman Klinger's committee is also investigating the 1993 firings in the White House Travel Office. Wednesday, the White House announced the appointment of a new security chief.